Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the eighth edition of the Maze and 2022 on mental health and social media. Let me briefly introduce the, um, our workshop. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to co-organize this workshop with Dr. Bagheri from Ryerson University, Dr. Inkipan from University of Ottawa, and Dr. Yang from Drexel University. Our half-day workshop is scheduled for three sessions. In current session, we have a keynote speech followed by two paper presentations. The second session includes a panel discussion and then two other paper presentations. Finally, in the last session, we will have our second keynote speech. Our first keynote speech will be presented by Dr. Goharian on NLP applications in mental health. Dr. Chowdhury is our second invited speaker and will talk about employing social media to improve mental health. Our panel discussion is on mental health and social media, including three panelists, Dr. Kernan Ku from Georgia State University, Dr. Saha from Microsoft, and Dr. Eskerberg from University of Guelph. Okay, uh, thanks again for joining us today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our first invited speaker, Dr. Goharian, who is talking, uh, who is going to talk to us about NLP applications in mental health. Uh, Dr. Goharian is clinical professor of computer science and associate director of the information retrieval lab at Georgetown University, which she co-founded in 2010. She joined the Illinois Institute of Technology from industry in 2000. Her research and doctoral student mentorship expand the domains of information retrieval, text mining, and natural language processing. Specifically, her interest lies in human computing applications such as mental health domain. Joined with her doctoral students, she received an EMNLP 2017 Best Line Paper Award and calling 2018 honorable mention both for papers on mental health and social media, for contributions to undergraduate and graduate curriculum development and teaching excellence. She was recognized with the IIT Julia Beveridge Award for faculty in 2009, the College of Science and Letters Dean's Excellence Award in teaching in 2005, and in 2002, 2003, and 2007, the Computer Science Department Teacher of the Year Award. She served as senior chair at ACL uh, 2018, ACL 2019, ACL 2020, and ACL 2021. She is also co-chair of CIR Women in Information Retrieval since 2019, focusing on gender pay inequity and women leadership. Uh, okay, let's welcome Dr. Goharian. I stop um, sharing my screen and uh, all is yours. So you can share your screen and start your presentation whenever you are ready. Is my presentation visible? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Fatone, thank you organizers for inviting me to give the talk and thank you very much for a very kind introduction. Uh, today I want to talk about NLP applications in mental health. When I talk to my students about mental health, um, I give them always a warning first that I, they are going to see some statistics that these statistics, they are uh, very depressing. I know that in this community, uh, most of you, you are, you are familiar with the statistics, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I 
prefer to give that warning for next several pages, the statistics that you will see before I get to the um, uh, works that uh, we have done. So per US Health and Human Services, about 4.2% of American adults suffer from serious mental illness, short SMI. Uh, these are the cases that the daily life of the uh, person is uh, badly impacted so that they cannot carry with their daily life. Uh, so if you add other cases that they are not uh, among SMI officially, then this number of the adult Americans that they are suffering from any sort of mental health condition, it is much higher. Unfortunately, only around 65% of SMI people that have been receiving uh, treatment. Now, per CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, suicide is a growing public health problem. And the numbers since 2000, they are 33% up. Looking at 2019 statistic that they gave, they said that 12 million Americans seriously thought about suicide. 3.5 million made a plan to commit a suicide. And 1.4 million attempted suicide. So in US, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. And every year, about 500,000 hospital visits, they are because of uh, attempt of self-harm. And unfortunately, every year, about 50,000 people, they die because of suicide. This is a world problem. It means that it is not only US, everywhere worldwide, based on World Health Organization statistic of 2021, over 700,000 people per year, they die because of suicide. The situation is dire when we are thinking about youth age 15 and 19, that suicide is their fourth, uh, is a, a, a fourth leading cause of death in that uh, age group. So the reality is that many, they don't receive help. Uh, either it's because they don't know it, people around them, they don't pay attention, or they don't have simply health insurance, like in some countries, including US, many people don't have health insurance. And those who have health insurance may not be covered for mental health. Another problem is stigma, that it is almost in every country, that they don't want that people know they are suffering from mental health, their coworker, their classmate, their family, because they think that they might be disadvantaged in their opportunities in the society or feeling more pressure. Now, there is also this reality that um, people go to social media, they are more comfortable that people don't know them and they post about how they feel about their mental status and their emotions or the diagnosis that they have. The chart that you see in front of you, it is just on subreddits, only few subreddits of, um, uh, on Reddit. So it is not showing, in fact, the participation on other social media. But on this one, you can see for ADHD, depression, and anxiety, you can see from 2013 to 2022, it is such an increase of participation. People post about themselves in these subreddits. Looking at statistics from Pew Research Center of 2018, about 95% of teens, teenagers, they have access to a smartphone and about 45% of them, they said it that they are constantly on social media, constantly they are checking. A National Center for Health Research reported that over 40% of girls and 20% of boys, they are spending at least three hours or more on social media platforms like Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and so forth. So people are on social media. 
and there are many news from different sources that they are talking about the negative impact of being so constantly on social media, the impact of lack of sleep that leads to depression and um, uh, feeling more depressed. And there are so many of these uh, reports that they are coming now and then here and there. And the recent news that it was last year and everybody heard about it is about the whistleblower from Facebook, which talked about the algorithms that they can um, attract um, and keep the youth engaged continuously with social media and social network platforms and the impact that it has on their health. Now, Recently, about just a few days ago, I was reading this news about parents in all different countries and in US and other places that parents that they have lost their kids to suicide, they are trying to take the matter in their hand as to filing the lawsuits against the social media companies and taking them accountable for the death of their uh, children, that the algorithm make this type of addiction in the kids so that they don't give up and they're continuously uh, flagging what they like or they don't and what likes what they post or not. So the question is that, what can we as computational scientists do to help? Obviously, I'm not talking about policy making here, nor I'm talking about social media algorithms. That is outside of this um, talk. But having that uh, reality in front of us, and we know that the social medias, they are there and um, people are active and young people are very active. Is there anything that we as computational scientists, they can do, for example, uh, having systems that they are integrated into their system for detecting, triaging, potentially finding the cases that we can give some sort of warning, giving a warning so that the counselor or people that they're looking at it, they can maybe pay attention. In our community, various communities related to NLP information processing and so forth, for many years, uh, researchers they have been working on this. So this is just an example of page. I can put several of these pages for you, the references, and it shows that people are active to work on. But what I want to talk today is um, I'm going to divide it in three groups. One group is talking about support forums. In this type of platform, the users voluntarily, they go and register in order to seek help. It means that their posts, they are open, they're describing how they feel and they're asking help. There is a counselor there that they are reading this post and they are trying to communicate with the person. And all the participants, in fact, that they are seeking help, they can also help each other or they communicate with each other. Now, the question can be also that, what about cases that people are on social media, but they are not on any um, subreddit or any registered platform that they are asking for, for help or they are talking about their mental condition, but they are on social media talking maybe about cooking or baking or sp uh, sport or entertainment. Can one still detect uh, any sort of mental health condition from the general language of the person. And finally, aside from the classification problem that given these posts, we want to classify and tag that, triage that, identify the severity of the post. Besides that, can we also reduce the amount of data so that in a line or two, a counselor or moderator who is checking these can uh, get a faster uh, idea about what is that uh, lengthy text of the user post is saying for expediting that knowledge. So that goes to summarizing the posts. 
Okay. So now about the uh, support forums that people go and register. I will talk about reachout.com. This is a site based on Australia that people youth age 14 to 25, they register to seek help. Uh, so the questions, they are that, can one use uh, these posts in order to triage based on the severity of potential of self-harm and what type of features they can be used? This was a challenge that some years ago was given. The data was given to um, a community and um, with the help of CLSI, Competition Linguistic Psychology, which is sponsored by ACL NACL um, uh, as a workshop. For a few years, they were working in this problem. The other one is identifying the mental health condition on general forums that here uh, I'm talking about Reddit to see that if we can distinguish mental health problems from the general language, can we look at the temporal aspects of the diagnosis? And if the user is not very active user and doesn't have much post, still can we detect or not? So for this line of research, we needed to have data, large scale data. And I will talk about it that how we constructed that to be able to address those questions. So let's first talk about uh, uh, reach out, which is, as I mentioned, it is dedicated platform. You have to, people have to register in order to seek help. So uh, over 65,000 of posts, they were uh, provided to participants that they were uh, 16, 17 groups and about 1200, 1200 of posts, they were labeled. So as you see, there are these labelings indicating less danger this severe situation, green, like the person says that so much going in my head, but I can manage my life. The thoughts are manageable. To the left-hand side, which is dark red, that the person might be in the verge of ending the life, right? So these posts, they were labeled. The challenge is that it is the lay language of the person, and um, it might be some fuzzy uh, uh, choice of words and detection of that to be able to triage. So this is a perfect classification problem with label data. And uh, everybody uh, built their systems, introduced their systems, mainly based on feature, uh, heavy feature engineering. And we also did that, that was several years ago using the post content, so bag of words, the dense representation of sentence, identifying the topics based on topic modeling, doing some post context, like how many sentences before or around or the last sentence, was the post during the day or night, some metadata, uh, some psycholinguistic features, given a word, what's the probability of that word to be related maybe to uh, being annoyed or anger or any characteristic. So we use the uh, look for that, linguistic inquiry word count. We use emotion lexicon, the pitch mode and so forth. So data set, as you see, was not balanced. It means that for the extreme cases that it was crisis, only 3% of the posts they were. So to evaluate really the quality for that group, uh, I would say that uh, could not be that reliable when you don't have that much of those cases. Okay, so people build systems, as I said, um, uh, almost all based on heavy feature engineering, and you can see the top groups. Uh, we participated 2016 and also here at the top here. And all together, you can see that systems that are using this type of characteristics, each system, each participants, maybe some of the features that I presented the previous page or not, like a position of the word and where it is in the thread and so forth. Uh, similarly, uh, we as a single or ensemble classifier. 
So the take of this page, in fact, is that takeaway from this page is that really based on this type of problem, one can have a good classification result when we are talking about this type of uh, social platforms that people register. And if you want to have a binary classifier that uh, it uh, indicates that the person's post is green or not. So if it is not, one can pay attention. So that will be this blue line. You can see that really over 90% if one, one can have that detection. And if we say that only the more extreme cases like to be red versus not red, again, by mid 70% F1, one can do detections. It means that this is not clearly replacing human being, nor it should, but it is giving a good pointer to a moderator to go and pay attention. We look to see what type of errors the systems they can uh, have. So what difficulties the classifier can have. And we identify three groups. One group, they were short, uh, posts that they are short. As you see here, when you read, you don't feel that this should be read as actual label was read. So you would think that like the classifier, you would indicate it is green. When we looked back at this user, we saw that this user was really in red situation based on many of the pr prior posts. But then the notion is that when you're going way before the prior post, it might also drift because it might be different conversation and different feeling during the time that changes. The next group is when the uh, tone of the user changes in the post uh, from maybe red to green and so forth. In this case, the actual label is yellow, but the system thought it was more serious because of more serious parts of the text. Now we go to long posts. In the long posts, if majority of the parts of the post, they are not serious, but a minor part, then the system does a mistake as well. Right? So here the system thinks that it is not as serious. So what happened with the outcome of uh, this challenge that for a few years was running was that this, they didn't have any automated system. It was based on manually. It means that moderators, they were sitting there, they read continuously the post, and then they were identifying if the person is in danger of suicide or not. And four hours approximately was taking time for them to be able to identify. And actually only less than 33% of the time was that the moderators, they could find those cases and interact. Majority of time, other people who were suffering, they were trying to, they were finding and communicating with each other. So based on these few years and the top systems are included in that, then they announced that they uh, utilized the knowledge of the workshop and the challenge and they automated their system to identify to detect and triage. And uh, my students, they, uh, we got some papers on that line of effort. So now we shifted to general uh, language to see that with the general language of the user, can we really answer the questions of, do we um, able to detect any mental health condition and what about their temporal aspect? And what if we don't have that many posts per user? Uh, do we let that user to go undetected or we can do something about it? So as I mentioned, we needed to build uh, a data set because we needed large scale uh, data. So we did that. So we built few of these data sets uh, based on the self-reported diagnosis of the users. Self-reported, uh, I will elaborate on it in the next few minutes. Uh, it is not that the person says, I think I have depression. It is that they report that um, if they were diagnosed. That is the way that we consider that. 
I will elaborate on that. But on depression, we uh, collected 9,000 diagnosed user with over 100,000 control. A small subset of that we labeled for the temporal analysis. Uh, we enhanced that data set to nine different mental health condition, uh, which we have 37,000 diagnosed users and over 300,000 control. So these data sets, they are provided to the community for their research uh, via DUA, data usage agreement, which um, person who asked for data set, they have to um, agree that they are not trying to violate the privacy of people. They are not going to identify the users uh, by copying their post and searching for that post. Uh, although the data it is cleaned, but uh, still the data usage agreement is very stringent. So because of that, uh, from the request uh, as of now, we uh, granted um, and distributed uh, worldwide about 100, uh, 200 um, uh, research groups, um, the data. Okay, so how did we build the data? So we have to identify diagnosed users. Uh, to identify diagnosed user, we don't want to consider the post that says, I don't feel like getting out of the bed because that can happen to everybody. What we want is diagnosed user to be the person who says that I was just diagnosed. It's not that the person says that I think I have, but the person says I am diagnosed. So we created some uh, patterns, uh, over about 150 some number of patterns that my doctor diagnosed me, I was just diagnosed with some mental health conditions. So um, we identify our diagnosed users based on these patterns. If it was uh, satisfying these patterns, then we took that person and based on the um, diagnostic and statistical manual of mental health, DSM-5, and using the lay language dictionaries of medicine and behavior, uh, to capture different terminology the person is using to express their problems, uh, we identify our diagnosed users. Now that we have our diagnosed users, we want to identify only those posts of that diagnosed user that they are general language. It means that these posts, they should not have any indication of mental health in them, nor they should be posted, should have been posted in any subreddits that relates to mental health. So if it satisfies these conditions, then we take the post as the general language of that diagnosed user. So now that we have our diagnosed user with its general, with his or her own general language, now we have to identify control users. So based on the one to nine mapping that we identify based on the uh, literature that per one diagnosed user, there is nine, approximately nine control users. It is one to nine in the society in US. Then we wanted to find our control users. So again, we went through this approach that our control user should be a person that has not posted anything in the subreddits of mental health, nor should have any match to exclusion patterns. Those are again, the patterns that they have mental health mentions in them. So if the user is satisfied based on these conditions, then it is our control user. But again, we want to be careful that they have similar behavior to our diagnosed user. So their activity, number, their participants, participation, frequency, and their interests of the topics, we wanted to be very similar to each other, and we considered that as well. Okay, at this point then, we ended up with this data set, SMHD, which has nine mental health, conditions. And as you see, 
there are different uh, frequency based on these conditions. For example, ADHD and depression, you see you have much more uh, users. But eating disorder in this data set, it is much less. So we wanted to see also that uh, what is the baseline quality uh, in respect of F1, you can see in front of you that uh, we tried different baselines and you see the problem is difficult because at the best we can get in 50s, the um, F1. So detecting mental health condition based on the general language, it is not an indication of mental health in the post, nor it is in mental health sub forum. It is maybe in talking about sport or cooking or anything else from the general language, you can detect, but it is uh, F1, it is um, still uh, lots of room for improvement. So this data and this baseline, hopefully people will be motivated to see if they can improve. And the papers, they were published on it. And as I said, data is available for uh, researchers to uh, work on it. So now the question that we wanted also to look at is that, can we capture the temporal aspect of diagnosis? For example, in high school, I got diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I've come a long way since then, and I have been off the meds for almost two years. So, is this person still is suffering? Is this condition current? Is this diagnosis a recent diagnosis or was in the past? So for answering this type of question, we needed to have data. Again, we are back to this data uh, labeling to be able to set a data set for the research. So here, um, we needed to label, so if this, um, uh, the human labeler or annotator, they had to decide that if this post is in last two months, within a year, within three years, or it's not clear or what that is. So in some cases, the expression might be like today or four months ago, so explicit. But in some cases, like when I was 16, I was diagnosed with depression. This one, um, it is um, inferable from the uh, age, but still we don't know that how old the person is. Unless the person said that, okay, now that I'm 25, okay, when I was 16, and we can see that how long ago that is. Talking about if the diagnosis is uh, a current diagnosis, or not, again, we might encounter very explicit and easier case. I was diagnosed with depression today, and we know that the date of that post, or might be after the divorce, I was diagnosed with depression. And unless there are some other additional temporal information, we never know that how long ago was the divorce. So the annotators cannot know, so they have to say, we don't know. In this case, we can see that the problem was in the past. When I was 16, I was diagnosed, but I'm all better now. So it means that in past, it was that uh, diagnosis, the person is fine right now or better now. So as you see, the problem is difficult even for a human annotator because information, it's not complete. There are fuzziness there in the language and it is incomplete. So a human labeler cannot have that uh, good quality of um, decision-making. So we had six annotator of double annotation of each of these posts and their inter rater agreement was not high. So the system, the classifier and human, they were similar in the same line as to making decision. So as you see, the problem is hard, not only for people, 
but uh, not only for machine, but for uh, person, for human. So this is all very challenging. Uh, missing information, person is not sure, and um, uh, that impacts. So this is really, uh, I would say, very uh, good room uh, for work for those that they are interested to generate uh, longer data, larger data set, and maybe one can identify more certain cases or group them in the labelings. And this has a good room and it's a, uh, a value to uh, have this line of research. Now, another aspect that one needs to pay attention is um, what about the users that they are not very active on uh, social media but they are also suffering very much from mental health conditions. Uh, we don't want to let them to go undetected. We all know that if you have more data, your systems, they can learn better and give better quality, uh, reliable answer comparing to situation that we don't have much data of the person. But it doesn't mean that the person who is not active is not suffering much or it is not in the verge of um, self-harm. So what can we do? So that was a question that we tried to look at it. So we used our RSDD data set for depression and uh, to analyze, to see that the behavior as far as the frequency of the post of the user, how it is in making decision by that classifier. So uh, we, call, we count the frequency and consider the median number of the posts across all of these posts as our threshold. And the users that they have less than that median number of the post, we call them in the grouping of below. And anybody who has above that median, it is called here above. So if you look at this, you can see that Regardless of the classification approach, SVM, logistic regression, CNN, BERT, regardless, we can see that the same behavior we see. When the classifier sensitivity is set to default threshold of 0.5, then you can see that it's substantial difference based on the frequency of the posts of the user two versus four, three versus six, three versus eight, four versus seven. So it really impacts that frequency. So we said that let's now for each of these groups below and above, let's uh, not have the default threshold, but tune it for that group. Okay, here we tune and in all these cases, and again, we observe the same thing, that still there is a big difference between below two versus five, right? three versus six, four versus eight, and here four versus seven. So still we see that there is a quality gap of the detection. So we said, let's look at the buckets of these um, hundreds, the first hundred posts. If the person has maybe only five, 100 posts or the first 100 of the posts of that user, right? The first 200 posts of user, the first 300, first 400 or the entire thing. See if we can see any difference in the detection. And as you see, again, regardless of the classification approach, which is used. Now, if we have our default, but now we come and tune that, based on that bucket, that 100, we tune that, we see that really it is impacting. So in all cases, we can really improve the detection rate. Uh, only one case was here that um, uh, we don't know what happened. This case uh, acted differently, but all cases we can see that it is substantial improvement in detection. So um, uh, it means that there is this encouraging to have that controlled evaluation 
for the low resource users so that we don't let those people who are not very active, their situation goes undetected. This is a, a um, recent work uh, which is going to be presented in LRAC 2022 in a month or two um, uh, that looks into this problem. Now, I want to shift uh, for the last component of the talk uh, to say that uh, let's move from the classification, which definitely has its own impact. Now, let's add to that another aspect that can be also complementary or independent and help to um, uh, identify um, the problem of the users uh, by the means of shortening the, num the, the number of words, by shortening the post. So it means that if a user's post is of a given length, like what you say in the left-hand side, we want to generate a short form of that, which you see in the right-hand side. I have blackened that because this is one of the posts and I uh, wanted to remove some information that uh, it is not uh, revealed. Uh, so as you see, this is a user's post uh, in one of the mental health subreddits. And this is a system generated post. When you read system generated post, you can understand exactly what's going on. So a moderator or counselor can in much faster way to read these two lines and get the idea of fast what is going on. So it's interesting that the post is mentioning about the person's um, process, thinking process about ending the life. And the system also captured that. I pointed that out to you because the Gold, the, the human written summary, uh, did not have that mention of the suicide thoughts, but the system generated captured that. Okay, so let me talk to you a little bit about gold because this is very important notion that what is our goal in any of the research that we do, and I'm talking about this specific uh, 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 research specific on uh, Reddit these subreddits and what is the meaning of gold there. Uh, for those that they are familiar with summarization research, uh, you know that uh, in order to know that your system generated summary is doing a good job or not, you have to have a gold summary. That summary is written by a human so that you can compare the summary that system generated with human written generated. Uh, human written summary. So, and then it generates a score, which is that is called the Rouge score, and that is commonly used. Okay, so in this specific situation, the summary is not written by a, a human that it is hired to read the post and write a perfect English and perfect language and grammatical issues and paying attention that the uh, summary is comprehensive. That is not the case. The same person who is suffering from mental health condition is writing their own summary. So those subreddits, mental health, they are giving this possibility that the user write a TLDR, that summary, short summary of their own post. So that person, might not want to write again very comprehensive, just might put few lines there. And that is why that I would say that the person did not mention about their suicide thought because the person already wrote about how he or she was feeling. So we need to consider this in understanding the research results that we have, that this gold is what is the goldness of that? So I wouldn't, going through these statuses and reading many of these posts and many of these uh, TLDRs, I noticed that the goldness of this gold is something that uh, to be paid attention. Now, this is what we have. 
right? This is what we have in this domain. All right, so we create this data, data set, called it MENSOM, and we are also right now uh, created data usage agreement, and uh, uh, soon we will make that available that if somebody wants to uh, use this data set for their research for summarization. So it contains over 24,000 posts. The paper gives all explanation about the table you see in front of you comparison of the length of the post with the human written summary. And altogether, it is approximately 4.5 the compression ratio. So it means that the human written, it is definitely much shorter than original post, post that source. Again, uh, this is um, in uh, LRAC of 22, this paper as well which will be presented um, in a couple of months, in a month or two. Okay, so now we want to see that, what is the characteristic of this data? Because that can help us always to see what type of uh, system we are going to focus and uh, what type of tuning potentially we can pay attention to. And here what you see, it shows the behavior of the biograms in the posts. And you can see that your biograms, they are not a certain location beginning or end. It is all over, right? So it can be anywhere the position of the biograms in um, uh, human written uh, summary. So when we are looking at various n-grams, uh, then we can, uh, Analyze to see that what ratio of these n-grams, they are novel n-grams, that they were not in the source, i.e. the human written post, the post of the user, but they are new in the human written summary. And you can see that, in fact, many of them, they are novel. If you look at this bucket here, where my cursor is, the two grams, uh, we had uh, around uh, 9,000 of, uh, let's say around 9,000 of these biograms and 80% of them, they were novel. It means that they are in human written summary, but they were not in original post. So we can see from two grams to at least six or seven grams, there are a lot of um, uh, high frequency of those engrams with high percentage of novel. So this is in uh, across the entire data. Now, looking in the test data, we can see that for human written summary, test data has same behavior as the entire data. Now, it's interesting that the system generated summary behavior is a little bit different there. It means that uh, from maybe four or five grams till uh, maybe nine grams, especially uh, six, seven, five, six, seven grams, they are, it means those segments, they are occurring, a uh, high percentage of those, they are novel. It means that they are not in the user post. Uh, so it means that the systems, they could generate good segments that they are not uh, definitely extraction, but they are generated by the system that uh, generates the summary. Uh, another analysis, which in different area of summarization, like news and so forth, people also did um, uh, this type of observation. We can see similar observation on this social media for mental health. Uh, is that uh, the uh, relative position of the oracle sentences, they are also all over, um, and not on oracle sentences, for those that are not familiar, the oracle sentences are those sentences that if you will look at the user post, we want to say these are the most important sentences. If you would grab those important sentences, put them together, create our summary, then what are they? So 
based on some heuristics, those sentences can be picked, right? Now, here what it shows you is that those sentences, they can be anywhere positioned in the uh, source, uh, but there is a good density at the beginning and towards the end. And this behavior was also observed in different other research on news as well. Uh, this analysis can give indication that for those that they want their system summarized to be extractive, they can maybe tune it also based on uh, uh, more emphasis on what part versus the other part. So we wanted to see that how is the quality of uh, summarization just based on the strong baselines that they exist. So the first one is lead two is something that generally is done, taking the first one or two sentence, which is not doing a good job, which we know why, because we saw based on the analysis of last pages. Oracle, picking those perfect sentences from Oracle from the source. So we want to see that if we can get to our Oracle. So the second group here, I mean, this middle group is, uh, state of the art extractive summarization system. And the last group is state of the art abstractive summarization systems. And we can see that BART is doing better than um, uh, others, but we can see that based on the metrics, what is the quality? It means that there is really room for improvement. And the summarization metrics of Rouge 1, 2, and L they are used for those who are potentially not familiar, uh, Rouge 1 calculates the overlap between the, uh, based on the single terms, how many of those single terms they are in common between the human written summary and system generated, how many two bigrams and how many substrings. Um, so that has that room for improvement. No. Because it is rouge, clearly many things they are not captured by rouge. So clearly we want always with summarization to do also human evaluation to see the summary which is generated is fluent or not? Is it informative? Is it complete or not? Is it complete but also short, concise or not? So we had a human evaluator to read the user written summary, and also the system generated or base one board and uh, score that one to five. It's very interesting that annotators, they thought that board, the system summary is better than user. But then because of the same notion that I mentioned, the goldness of our gold, it was written by the same person who was suffering from mental health condition. So the fluency was impacted. They wrote their own post. They might have not repeated important things in their uh, uh, summary. So um, that is important thing to pay attention. And now uh, it means that about 60%, 59% of the cases, they said that BART was doing better. 41% right? of cases, they said human written summary is better. In either of the cases, the annotators, they found the informativeness to be the metrics to make their decision based on, as you see. So let me show you now a few examples. Uh, clearly, we don't have time that we read the post and so forth, but I did that job for uh, you. I read the post. At, as well as, as, well as uh, all annotators. Um, and uh, you can see that I marked the ones that they are doing good job. It means that fluency, completeness, preciseness, and so forth. I blackened here because this was a unique thing and I didn't want to reveal. The cases that was problem generally went to situations like negation. So this post captured really good stuff positive, but negation part changes the meaning. That's not good. And the last one, changing the meaning completely change everything, also not good. So to see that really, what are the cases that impacts 
the negative aspect of fluency, we can see these two groups. The sentences, they turn complex by the system generated. It creates a long sentence and the components, the segments, they are attached by and. So this was perceived negative by the annotators. Another problem was reputation, as you see mood swings. Looking at informativeness, um, the uh, system has a little bit problem by doing inference. The system generated did much better um, than human that didn't want to repeat all of their problems, but the system could capture all the diagnosis. However, the system has problem to do inference. This phrase was actually a real inference that human being did to write it in their summary, but system was not able to do that. So this uh, type of analysis and this work um, and the baselines, they indicate that there is a good uh, work to be done and we motivate researchers to work towards this direction and um, uh, go beyond the baselines. So in this talk, um, I covered uh, various aspects and the references they are available online. Uh, none of this work could have been done without the hard work of all the past students that they are now working successfully current students, past and current collaborators. And I thank them, every single of them uh, very much. And now to the community, I would like to say that there is still work to do. As you notice here also, um, things that I covered, uh, good room for improvement and everything, creating varied, varying data sets, expanding human evaluation and doing extensive human analy error analysis in order to improve the models and uh, results. Actionable outcomes, they are extremely important. I give uh, one example of reach out, but there are a lot of challenges and obstacles. Uh, bridging with clinicians, it's a huge challenge, right? We all or many of us uh, have tried and uh, most of the time one fails and maybe some cases one can succeed. It's a huge challenge, but it's extremely important because clinicians, they are the ones that they know about uh, the domain. We are computational scientists. That is a lack of knowledge that we have and clinicians. So it is interdisciplinary effort. Uh, can the patients uh, opt in and provide their social media through the doctors that people like us, we can really work on those patients in uh, coordination with clinicians and send a, a, a warning to the clinicians if that patient posted something on their social media. These are things that researchers uh, uh, many uh, they have been thinking about it and there are here or there some successes uh, that the, some levels of uh, maybe um, steps. Uh, but uh, maybe it is easier uh, for integrating our system into existing social media because we all saw that majority of youth, they go to social media and they are way too much involved more than they should on social media. So at least maybe our systems, they can give some type of warning and indication. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening and for any of our data, please visit the site and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much for your informative presentation. Very interesting topic. So I think um, we have five minutes to take questions and we can take one or two questions. So any questions from the audience? Uh, 
I see a question. Could you please summarize the text features you're using? Uh, summarize the text features you're using. Can you elaborate so that I'm not answering something off of your question? Are you talking about summarization or you're talking about the classification? Uh, if you're talking, so it's a keywords, key phrases. So if you're talking about, because there are different problems, right? In summarization, if you want to create a summary, there are different approaches. You're abstractive or extractive. Generally, extractive uh, grabs. What it does is that it grabs exact sentence as human as as written. Uh, so it has to have that algorithm picking the best sentences based on key phrases, keywords. As you texted here, I can see definitely any of them. They can be features to identify those important sentences and they are extracted. Um, now in abstractive you're generating, so it might be still some uh, keywords or phrases from the text and some they can be generated, might not be in that given text, but it might be in that domain that it is uh, learned. Um, if that was your question or not, then please you can, uh, on mute or you can text further. I see a hand, Diana. Oh, hi, uh, I just want to thank you very much for the exciting talk and uh, my my research group at the University of Ottawa was using some of your data sets, uh, not for summarization because that's new work, uh, for the one for depression and classification and multiple diseases. And my PhD student, Prasadit, is online. He could comment on how he tried to improve over the baselines. But yeah, I really appreciate all the work and sharing the resources. And just to briefly comment, we had also difficult issues with the clinicians trying to make use of what we are doing. So I like your comment that maybe social media platforms could themselves have some sort of filter, maybe discrete one. Uh, Facebook, maybe they have some sort of suicide watch, something. Do you know what they are using? Or I don't know how to convince social media to do it and what's the best way to do it. It's always complication. Yes, you're right. First of all, thank you for your comment. Uh, and also thank you for using the data set. I hope that you can get uh, uh, the, the baselines. Um, yes, I think that uh, the society really put pressure on social media platforms. Uh, otherwise, um, I don't know people here. This is my own uh, opinion. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, think that they will jump in to do things like that. But uh, this type of you know, whistleblower and the parents and media, uh, they kind of, I think, uh, trying and they have been trying to enforce. And some platforms, they said that, as you mentioned, that they have put their own watch, like a suicide watch or mental health. Um, what is the quality of what the work they do and what algorithm they have and what outcome they have and do they find anything? I don't know. And um, I hope that uh, it will be more transparent and they can really release more information to say that how successful it is or not. If they have done and I'm not aware of that, I apologize for uh, yeah, I, we don't know, yeah. I was just curious if, if yes, you but, have more information. <laughs> no, but uh, no, sorry, I, I don't. But I, uh, uh, I think that it is good that um, one can approach um, and how easy they are approachable or not. But I think that that is something that we can uh, put it on the agenda of to-do list to see that if we can approach these platforms mm -hmm. and see that what responses they get. Actually, I have added that on my to-do list. And if I'm going to be successful or not, no idea. But yeah, I'm thinking maybe every user could have some sort of regular feedback, like a color chart. You are happy, angry. What's your level? and kind of a self-monitoring and when it's going to red at least the user knows 
But it has to be accurate though that otherwise the users would be annoyed of that. But the user could maybe provide feedback. No, I'm not angry. So maybe the classifier could be, you know, personalized in that exactly. way. So learn, adapt to that user. But this would be like a regular thing. Everybody say, how I do, how do you feel? And the user, the social media could have a like an icon in the background and the user agrees or not. Yeah. And when it goes to red, at least has some. But maybe that the you know the user who has mental health sees a red there, they don't know how to self-regulate. <laughs> anyway, I was no, just no, no, it is definitely mm -hmm. no, I appreciate and I think that the privacy and that stigma, so if it is done such a way that it is not mm -hmm. visible to the public, mm -hmm. but it is kind of in background going. Mm -hmm. uh, they can utilize for personalization of detection of that given person in case mm -hmm. that the social media platforms care and they do thank that. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Very um, um, exciting discussion. So um, thank, thank you, you very for much. Joining. Yeah, we have to start a uh, paper presentation because of uh, the time. So, um, Michael, do you are you available to share your screen and start your uh, presentation? You have 10 minutes to uh, present your paper, followed by three minutes to for question answering. Yeah. Um, Okay. Um, am I sharing the right screen? I hope not. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, actually, you are, I think you are sharing, but I can't see um, anything right now. It's a black screen right now. I could see it, but not now. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, it's sharing the right screen. Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, hi, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, my name is Michal Monsalis. Uh, I'm from Drexel University, uh, and my co author is my advisor, uh, Chris Yang, who's um, a part of this workshop as well. And I will be talking about suicidal ideation on Reddit and discussing some pattern that emerged from analyzing this data. Um, so, I know uh, the previous uh, speaker spoke about Reddit, but um, I'll just introduce it. So, um, so for those of you not familiar with the site, it is a social media site that allows for anonymity. Um, so the site is com sorry, comprised of millions of subreddits, which are topic-based message boards. So one of the message boards is Suicide Watch. Uh, so all the subreddits are moderated by humans. And um, uh, Suicide Watch is specifically meant as a space to express feelings of suicide ideation. Um, so it's trigger warning. Um, I'll be talking more about suicide here in this talk. Um, so uh, we had um, two hypotheses in this research. So one was, uh, do users um, want to, we want to know where users uh, start. Maybe they start in like depression and they feel worse and progress to suicide, or maybe it's the opposite. They start off in uh, suicide watch and then they go somewhere else to kind of express more specific feelings. Uh, and then also do users express suicide, who express suicide ideation, they have maybe some unique patterns uh, in terms of um, the, the focus was a little bit on, on um, sentiment, but more like in terms of volume and, and patterns of like, um, you know, do posts increase in frequency or things like that. Um, so more of a quantitative analysis of the post. And so some assumptions, so first of all, terminology, we have like an opening post that a user creates a prompt that's called a thread. Below that would be a comment. And then finally below that is a response. And also um, we made an assumption that due to the human moderation and the rules of the subreddit, um, any uh, thread would contain suicidal ideation, like someone expressing, oh, I, you know, I feel very negative feelings and, um, so it's not 100% the case. I know that occasionally there will be like a thread that will slip in, but since that's what the subreddit is intended for, that was kind of the working assumption here. 
Um, so next, uh, our data set came from the push shift API. So the push shift API takes Reddit and takes like a, a snapshot in time of Reddit. So uh, it's a static data set. Um, so it's not perfect, but for the purposes of this, because we don't look at like likes or you know upvotes, things like that. So we don't care if those change over time. Um, and so using this API, we identified users who created a thread on Suicide Watch between January 2019 and August 2019, and then created this pool of users. And uh, then to examine their post history, we went back six months before that start date and gathered data from uh, the six months before and this period. So from July 2018 to August 2019. And that gave us a little bit under uh, 5.9 million posts and about 26 and a half thousand users. All right, so we talked about uh, progression. I talked about progression. So we can define progression as kind of moving through stages. So like, for example, going from uh, a passive suicidal um, ideation to active. So like from just thinking you don't want to live to uh, actually having like a plan of how you would you know do it um, so to identify this progression we uh, we kind of like I said we thought like if someone moved maybe from depression to suicide maybe that was a progression in terms of worsening of, of their 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 feelings so we created a, a directed graph where the nodes are subreddits and then the edges represent a, pro a progression um, between the subreddits so let's say and, and then we looked at the last n which is 10 posts and, and uh, the weights represent the number of users who had this progression. So let's say I went to depression and then I went and like answered a question on, on memes or something. And then I went to suicide. So if that happened within 10 posts of each other, I counted uh, a progression as going from depression to suicide, even though there was one or two posts in the memes subreddit. Because I didn't assume that you, you progress exactly from one, one post to the other. I mean, I, I assume that there was some gap that maybe you went somewhere else, you answered a question that you had from yesterday. So, so you'll laugh for that little bit of uh, in a gap. But we also did a bit of uh, sentiment analysis. So we classified the sentiment uh, in the Reddit post using Vader, uh, which is a Python library that applies a rule-based model for sentiment analysis. So that Vader is, uh, was uh, developed using social media data. So I felt it was uh, relevant here. Um, so this is our, okay, so this is our progression graph. So even though it's, it looks kind of big, if you notice here, um, we have the, this like um, suicide watch subgraph. And then if you can zoom in. This would help. So everything is connected to Ask Reddit because it's a place that most people go to. But um, the one thing that we observe is uh, that the weights that were the thickness of the of the um, edges are about the same. So if you look at the data, it actually looks the the weights are about equal. So about half people, you know, go from like relationship advice to suicide watch, and about half the, the people go from suicide watch to relationship, for example. Uh, and another thing to note is if someone went from relationship advice to suicide watch and then they went back, we didn't count that as, uh, as, as a, an, in the edge. So, so you can only go in one direction. Um, and then, so we see only, even though there are millions of subreddits on Reddit, there are only about eight subreddits that are directly connected to the people progress from to suicide or to from suicide watch. So we have depression, relationship advice, teenagers, self-harm, off my chest, advice, and then memes and ask Reddit, which are very general. Um, okay. And then uh, we looked at the changes in uh, volume of, uh, of posts. So uh, the first graph is like the average daily uh, posts and then zero is the relative day of your first post on your first suicidal ideation on Suicide Watch. So we can see that the data is heavily skewed. So we have over 120 posts uh, on average, like per person per day. For, for any person who posted, we took you know the average. Uh, and then 
here the the median is this this graph is the same with the median is about eight in the peak so it's heavily skewed but we see the same pattern which is uh, around 20 to 30 days like around 20 days before the first suicidal ideation the post volume goes up and then on the day of it goes down dramatically and and back up to like where it was before and then back down again to kind of the same level by 20 days so if someone didn't either harm themselves or leave reddit we see that the kind of the the posts return to sort of a baseline so i don't we can't obviously make a conclusion about anything emotional using this data but like in terms of posts they kind of return to themselves uh, and then uh, looked at looking at sentiments, there is a slight increase. We so this is the uh, the day of uh, suicidal ideation, like the relative day. Uh, but when the the percent of uh, negative sentiment uh, posts went up from like twenty eight to about thirty uh, percent total of all the posts for each day, uh, but that was shown not to be statistically significant. So to summarize the results, uh, we see that there's progression uh, from and to suicide watch at about the same rate. Um, we only see progression from about eight subreddits and then um, the post volume, it kind of goes up down on that day and back uh, down. And um, so the conclusions is, uh, so, you know, if you go to Google and you type suicide, Google gives you like a phone number to call Reddit does the same. If you search for suicide, it gives you this uh, get support for yourself or other people like these resources. Um, so using this work, you know, we, we can. Uh, this was kind of a short paper, but we can build on it to create a more. And I, I know the previous speaker talked about this. Create a more complex model that will uh, put up that prompt uh, for for users who. Um, the, display certain behaviors. Uh, like if they start from, you know, relationship advice and then they show some certain uh, features, maybe do more like looking at the NLP. I know there's other research uh, by Moon Moon to Chandra looking at um, the actual, like uh, the text of what users write, but you know, this research is focused uh, primarily on the quantitative side. Um, so yeah, that's, um, okay. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. And I'll take questions. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, thank you so much for your great presentation. Um, any questions from the audience? Okay, so, um, you know, because of time, you can post your uh, questions on chat and she will be available to answer your uh, questions. Let's move on to the next paper, accepted paper entitled A Large Scale Temporal Analysis of User Lifespan Durability on the Reddit Social Media Platform. It will be presented by Amir Hossein. So Amir Hossein, would you share your uh, slides? Hello everyone, do you have the slides? Yes. Yeah, very good. So, um, to start. Hello, everyone. I'm Amir Hussain Nadiri, and today I will be presenting to you our recent work, which is a large scale temporal analysis of user lifespan durability on the Reddit social media platform. Um, okay. With the growing popularity of social media platforms, many users are considerably engaged in at least some of these platforms. They use them to express their feelings, views, and all sorts of things about various topics as they have seen today. Uh, they do so by sharing them as posts. They also receive feedback from other users, in the form of comments, likes, and other features that their chosen platform provides to them. Uh, we already know from previous works that one's experience with social networks is associated with changes in their well-being. Uh, in this work, we focus on their initial experience. We want to find uh, 
the initial factors associated with their decision to stay on the platform or leave it. Uh, now, the way that this staying or leaving is associated with the well-being is that by staying, they are kind of signaling that they have felt a sense of belonging and they felt that they could use this platform to share their thoughts, feelings, and other stuff. So uh, we examine three factors. First, perception of the content they create and the responses they get using the score and replies they receive. Secondly, the diversity of the content they create using the diversity of the sub-communities they were active in, in our case, the subreddits they were active in, and how they moved between these subreddits. And finally, the amount of content they create using the lens and time of their created content. Uh, these make up the three main questions of our research. And obviously, we use Reddit data to experiment and try to find answers to these questions. So uh, Reddit is a social media platform, as you have heard a lot of times today, where users can post anything, reply to other posts by commenting on them, and they can also give upvote or downvote to posts or comments. However, only the aggregation of votes is shown, which is basically upvotes minus downvotes, and we call it the score of the comment or post. Reddit consists of many subreddits, which focus on a specific topic that is presented by that subreddit's name. Users write and share posts on subreddits, and uh, there are like sub-communities in the whole platform. Uh, here is an example of a post on Reddit. I have marked its score, the number of comments, the user who has written it, and the time it has been published. Um, we also know what subreddit it has been published in, but it's not here in the screenshot, and we use these features in our analysis. Now, uh, to construct a social network dataset from Reddit, we consider each user a node and act of replying to others' comments or posts as a means of creating an edge. For example, here you can see one user has a uh, reply to the post, which is shown by the orange arrow. And we translate this reply as an edge from the node representing the user who wrote the comment to the node representing the user who wrote the post. Um, also, the two comments uh, below that, that reply to the first comment, are translated to edges from the writers to the writer of the first comment. And basically, these arrows represent the edges in our data set. And we also use push shift data set as our source of Reddit data. So the data set we created is, uh, spans about 15 years from 2005, beginning of Reddit until the end of 2019. It has about 62 million nodes and 6.7 billion edges, which represent unique users and comments. Um, deleted accounts are excluded from our analysis. However, there Replying data is available in our data set, which we have published together with this paper. Um, the features of each post and comment, which I mentioned earlier, scores, reply count, and whatnot, are considered edge attributes in our data set. So each edge has a timestamp, score, and other associated features. Um, Okay, for our main analysis, uh, we, we first filter the data. Reddit had a relatively small number of active users in its early years. And in order to eliminate its effect on our analysis, we consider only activities after 2012. And as the amount of activity before this period is small, we only dismiss a small fraction of data. Um, also, to have enough data for each user to be able to extract meaningful patterns from their behavior, we consider users with at least a specific amount of activity in their duration of stay. Um, we use a minimum of 40 comments for our main results and report the results with other parameters in the paper's appendix. Uh, you can look at the main paper for them. And 
Okay, in our analysis, we classify users into two groups. First, users who didn't leave the network in their early activity stage and continue their activity on the platform. Uh, we call this group durable users. And secondly, users who left the platform early, which we call early departing. We separate, uh, we separate these groups using two parameters, T early and T late. Uh, users who stay active for less than T early are considered early departing. And users who remain active for more than T late are considered durable. OK, uh, for this T late and T early, we use values 90 days and 100 days in our primary analysis, and again, report the results with other parameters in the paper's appendix. Uh, this table here presents the details of groups generated using these parameters. Uh, the statistics show that durable users group obtained by these parameters are, in fact, active users and are going to stay a long time on the platform. So it's from lifespan, number of comments. Uh, okay, we define relevant features for each of our three main uh, research questions. We computed these features on a per comments basis for each group's initial n comments, n being 40 in our main results, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, just to point out the benefits of this approach, we can say by doing so, we are giving equal weight to each user's behavior in our aggregation. And as a result, the effect of votes will be negligible. Um, OK, let's move to the results. Let's look at the results regarding our first question, which is about the perception of user-created content. Um, the x-axis is comment number, one representing the first comment to the second, and so on. And this plot in general presents the average score of each group's comments. And the glow around it shows the 95% uh, confidence interval. And uh, as you can see, there is a gap in the initial feedback uh, each group got. Over time, durable users receive steady feedback, but early departing received gradually less positive feedback. Uh, a similar trend can be seen in the number of their received replies. So not only did they get fewer upvotes and more downvotes, uh, they received fewer replies. And also to check the quality of those received replies, we examine the score of those received replies. And as you can see, the, the um, same trend is also visible here. Um, we can conclude from these results regarding our first research question that early departing users have an initially promising start and receive more positive feedback, but over time, they face a considerable decrease in the positivity of the feedback they receive. So uh, regarding content diversification, which is the center point of our second research question, uh, we first examine the trend of posting in diverse subreddits. This plot shows how many different subreddits users have posted since their early comments. Both groups seem to focus on a few subreddits. However, different users post a slightly more diversified content. And if we divide the time frame into windows of 10 comments and look at the number of unique subreddits in each window, we see the same trend, which is durable users' contents being a little more diversified. Uh, again, also, when we look at the distribution of comments over the first communities they engaged with, as we expect, since early departing users are more focused on fewer subreddits, they tend to post on the early subreddits more. Um, Another feature that we examined uh, is the number of jumps in those windows we defined, um, which is the number of changes in the sequence of subreddits that the user has commented on. 
Basically, a low value shows that they tend to post in the same subreddit continuously, and a high value indicates that they are moving between subreddits. Um, here we can see the early departments are doing more jumps, which is interesting because uh, we saw they were active in less unique subreddits, but they are jumping more. Um, Okay, so from the plots we saw, we can establish three factors in the early departing behavior regarding content diversification. Uh, first, they focus on fewer subreddits. Secondly, they, they post more in these subreddits. And finally, they frequently move between these subreddits. Um, okay, our terrible research question. Um, Okay, to answer our third research question regarding content contribution, we first look at how long they took to post their early comments. There is a vivid difference between the posting behavior in this manner. Um, as you can see, early departing users post their early comments at a higher rate, uh, about double the rate that durable users post. Also, they tend to write longer comments in the means of length. Here, we examine the length of the comments in characters. And here, you can see the length using the voice count. So we can conclude that this is not just based on the choice of vocabulary. And they are, in fact, posting longer comments. And to conclude our findings regarding this research question, we can say that early departing users post more frequently, uh, meaning they post their early comments much sooner and their posts are relatively longer than other users. And this concludes our main results here. Let's go to, okay, regarding limitations based on the data Reddit provides, we cannot distinguish posts and comments of different users who deleted their accounts because Reddit gives the same username for all of them, which is deleted. Uh, also, we do not have access to deleted posts because obviously they are deleted. And another factor is that we didn't distinguish users who stopped posting from those who totally left the platform. Uh, because again, we didn't have access to the data that of their other activities. Uh, those other activities might let us distinguish these behaviors, like uh, distinguish users who left the community and users who just stopped uh, doing the activity. And in summary, based on our findings, we can say positive community feedback is an important factor in the decision-making process for users to stay on the platform and keep contributing. Uh, also, the number of sub-communities the users post at the beginning of their stay is positively correlated with how long they tend to stay on the platform and how gradually users encounter the platform and post is associated uh, with the duration of their stay. Uh, finally, for future works with the data set made available together with this paper, a lot more temporal network analysis research is possible. And here is a short term link to the data set. If you want to take a quick look, I can use it. Um, Okay, I'm done. Thank you all for being here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you yeah. so much for your wonderful work and uh, <laughs> presentation. So, any questions from the uh, audience? Just a quick question. Uh, the early departure, do you think they are because they don't get enough interesting support or because maybe they feel better? A any way to tell apart this? You know, we can just assume from some of these plots and make some claims. There is no facts and fact checking that we can do. But based on the first result I showed, I 
think it's because they're uh, gradually receiving less positive feedbacks. It's my own opinion uh, from what I saw in the analysis. And I think they had a very good head start and they had high opinions of themselves. And after a few posts, a few comments and some activity, they didn't receive the same feedback they received earlier, like didn't get much engagement or attention. It's obvious from number of received replies. And after a few comments or posts, they decided to stop um, posting, commenting, or doing activities, or eventually leave the platform. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I was thinking about the suicide Reddit, where it's not a yeah, different, yeah. but you are, you're looking at all forums, I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. And I have uh, one quick question. Uh, you yeah. know, you collected valuable data set, and you mentioned that you are going to make it available for uh, public. And I was wondering, um, you know, you talked about the data set a lot, but would you elaborate more on the applications, other applications that your data set uh, can contribute to? Yeah, sure. Uh, as you know, it's a uh a large scale network data set and we didn't have such large scale networks previously on Reddit. They were just small uh, Reddit data sets. And the other feature that we have here is we have uh, like uh, changed the data set to um, somehow that users are nodes now and the edges are their connections together. So, uh, uh, we can see the patterns of their like moving between subreddits because uh, we also collected the data regarding the activities in different subreddits. We have subreddits as a feature of edges. So we can see how these users' activities change over time. And it's possible because it's a temporal data set. We have timestamps. And we can see how they move between subreddits and uh, it kind of can show how their interests change, how they're uh, like uh, wanted to do activities in some topics after doing activity in other areas. And uh, we can also see um, how uh, generally people move from areas to another areas. And also I have seen that it can be categorized somehow uh, we can categorize subreddits in different aspects, like if there are general uh, subreddits like uh, image, like fun, jokes, and some kind of like that. And there are particularly uh, some specialized subreddits, like, uh, I don't know, related to a specific board research on something or something like that. And we can distinguish users' behavior between these uh, general subreddits and special subreddits either. And there's a lot of room for doing different kind of research here. And this data set is a feature rich data set. And uh, we try to make it accessible and easy to use and easy to use a schema, a clean data set, easy to parse. And I think, Thank you so uh, much. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. And I would like to welcome Dr. Tex uh, to the uh, workshop. Thank you for joining. So um, I'm um, going to uh, chair this panel, uh, try to uh, moderate the discussion. I'm Diana Engwin. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Ottawa in Canada. I'm very happy to have three uh, panelists. and. Um, uh, I think we will go in the order from the, from the webpage. Uh, we have uh, Ugur Kursunku, Gustav Saha, and Joshua Skorburg. And um, I will introduce each speaker, that one speaker, then uh, speaker can talk for five, 10 minutes, maximum 10 minutes. Then we'll move to the next speaker. He can present something, express a little bit what he thinks about what he wants to share, then to the third speaker. And then I would ask you to hold your questions until all three panelists uh, present a little bit their opening remarks. And then I would invite for questions for all three and um, open discussion 
to, to, to you know it's a panel so it's free form and uh, for the panelists feel free to uh, to share screen or whatever is easy for you uh, so um, is it okay if we go in this order that uh, we posted on the on the website thank you very much for being here uh, so uh, let me not uh, um, let me get uh, started then with the first panelist Ugur Kursunku is an assistant professor at Georgia State University previously a postdoctoral fellow of AI Institute University of South Carolina he has his PhD in computer science from University of Georgia his research at the intersection of human society computing designing socially socially responsible human centered intelligence systems by integrating knowledge to significantly enhance contemporary AI and data science methods and this is very you know hot topic how to use AI and in the best ways so thank you very much uh, so you have um, up to 10 minutes of opening remarks um, thank you very much can you hear me first of all yes I can hear we can hear sure uh, can I share my screen I hope so I hope the moderators enable that sure <laughs> Yes, we can see. Okay. Right. Think, yeah, you can see my screen, I guess. Yes. Okay, super. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all, to share my uh, research, my uh, our work, actually. So this is a joint work uh, with the University of South Carolina AI Institute and Rice State University Department of Psychology. And uh, we started working on COVID-19 and mental health and social media at the intersection of these three. And we tried to extract some insights from, uh, from the, from the COVID-19 pandemic and how it was impacting uh, so social quality of, uh, of society and our population. So um, first of all, I mean, uh, there's a massive impact of pandemic on health and society. We have more than 6 million deaths so far and 500 million confirmed cases globally. And specifically in the US, it is 80, 80 million confirmed cases and closing to 1 million deaths just because of COVID-19. So that also uh, brings a lot of uh, impact on societal uh, societal day-to-day -day life and uh, social quality and well-being of the, uh, of the people and individuals. So specifically, uh, we are focusing on uh, in our work, mental health, depression, uh, anxiety, and, and addiction. Uh, and we also looked at uh, other type of impact on, on, on the well-being of society and individuals, for example, gender-based and domestic violence because of the uh, government intervention and int introduction of the uh, uh, some prevention uh, procedures such as state uh, state home orders uh, and, and, and shelter in place orders. So we have utilized our existing work to be able to uh, identify the, uh, the content uh, related to uh, mental health, uh, specifically depression and anxiety, as well as addiction uh, among the COVID-19 related content. And we are using mostly uh, our own techniques, including the semantic filtering, that is uh, filtering the content that is related to uh, uh, COVID-19 and mental health. Uh, and as you know, social media data is actually very noisy data and we are using this type of uh, filtering mechanism. Uh, and also we are utilizing our own language models that is incorporating knowledge and external knowledge in the form of uh, knowledge graphs and, and other type of uh, ex external knowledge. And at the end, we are, uh, in, we are uh, coming up with the uh, with the scores that is related to each of these uh, conditions, depression, anxiety, and addiction. Uh, and the content uh, during this pandemic has been quite interesting because uh, people have been quite open and they are being uh, very transparent almost because uh, there's a lot of social stigma attached to the uh, mental health issues and specifically uh, during COVID-19, people have been more uh, open uh, and they are trying to express uh, the conditions that they have, that they are in, uh, for example, the anxiety related or depression related, or if they are especially during the first week of pandemic so they are more like uh, staying at home and they are uh, dealing with the parenthood or dealing with uh, homeschooling their kids and, and so on 
So to be able to do this, so we have uh, developed a social quality index that is accounting that is accounting for uh, these three conditions: uh, depression, anxiety, and, and addiction. Uh, so these uh, uh, social quality index scores, so they they didn't uh, account for the preceding state conditions, uh, but. Uh, we are we are looking at the change in the uh, social quality index scores uh, that is informing the comparisons between uh, between states. So we are especially the change in uh, SPI scores is potentially very informative, particularly uh, for comparisons between states. And so for that reason, we transformed the raw uh, scores into real state rankings, and we are looking at the uh, at the uh, state rankings uh, based on the SQIs. Uh, and then uh, we are using this to examine the effect of uh, external events, uh, for example, school closures, business closures, unemployment, and lockdown, uh, whether it is how, how it's impacting mental health overall uh, of society and population. So, um, yeah. So, uh, what we find at the end, the states actually differ and they change over time, and it depends on uh, it depends on the circumstantial uh, factors uh, in each state. So, for example, the, the conditions and circumstances in Idaho is very different than California, and it's very different than uh, Florida, uh, as well as Alaska. And uh, we are looking at the relative SPI uh, for this reason, and looking at the external external event influence uh, over the over the population and how they are impacting during the pandemic. <clears throat> so uh, when we look at the specifically the first month of the pandemic, so because in the first week, in the first month of the pandemic, there have that there was there was a lot of very drastic changes in social life from financial factors to social factors, uh, state uh, state home orders shelter in place and uh, paying off a lot of people from uh, from their jobs uh, and, and unemployment actually spiked like overnight maybe like uh, from three percent to 16 percent and these factors have been actually uh, very influential over the social well-being of people in the first month specifically so we looked at the first month uh, for this reason and and, and specifically, we realized there have been uh, clusters of states that are sharing uh, similar patterns. And when we look at the uh, this cluster of uh, states, for example, Indiana, Ohio, New Hampshire, Oregon, Washington, Wyoming. So this is this these. Uh, these clusters of states, they are actually on a decline in terms of SQI, uh, in terms of their social quality and social well-being, uh, and when you look at the states, so it is actually declining uh, week by week. Uh, here, the darker means the better social quality uh, overall. <clears throat> so, as we cluster these uh, states into four different clusters, so uh, so we we are showing like one only three here. Uh, so we are realizing they are sharing the uh, very similar patterns. So the one is actually an uptrend, and the other one is downtrend. Downtrend meaning social quality is actually going worse, and the uptrend is actually improving over time. And <clears throat> we. I mean, of course, these are just hypotheses, and we are just we, we need to test these hypotheses. And the reason may be because of these declines and improvements, maybe because of the uh, financial situations, it may be because of the, uh, the government intervention, uh, government regulations, or the societal life, and so on. When we look at the content, so uh, for the cluster that is uh, uh, that that is improving uh, social quality. When you look at the frequency of the content related to depression, addiction, anxiety, so there's actually a correlation between the SQI values and how it's, how it's going from bad to, uh, to better. Uh, the frequency is actually uh, decreasing at the same rate. So as the uh, SQI is going better, the mental health related issues are actually going lower in terms of its value, volume. So when we look at the, um, external factors. So 
specifically in the in the first four weeks, so external factors are being uh, a huge uh, influence uh, uh, over these over the uh, social well-being of individuals. And among many external factors, financial events and specific government interventions have substantial effect on social, social quality of people. Uh, specifically, business uh, and individual relief announcements, business, business closures, uh, increase in unemployment and stay-at-home orders. So whenever the unemployment increase, for example, is much more significant than the previous week, uh, the social quality is worse, and but whenever the individuals and business are given uh, financial relief, the social quality is better. So we see actually the specific financial factors are being uh, a, a big influence over the well-being of individuals. So um, here uh, we are looking also uh, uh, states and, and the clusters for a different time frame uh, in terms of the, uh, the their uh, changes in uh, based on patterns of change in, in their SPI values. And we obtained also uh, four different clusters and the, the two are the downtrend and the other two is the uptrend based on their statistical patterns. So we also uh, see uh, in the downtrend states, for example, as the downtrend states, meaning the social quality is going worse, so the volume is actually going up for the uh, for the mental health related uh, tweets and content. When we look at the external events, so we see similar patterns for this particular time frame as well. So I would like to show you also uh, another. Uh, cluster for the same time frame, and we see a similar pattern as uh, the volume is actually going down while the uh, social quality is actually improving uh, in these states. Uh, and similarly, we are looking at the external events and the uh, financial related factors uh, is actually improving, uh, playing an important role here too. Uh, for example, the Financial Aids or CARES Act Fund and related grants. So these are actually improving the overall uh, social well-being of the, of the individual and society. So this is also another time frame. So we are looking at these time frames based on the based on the ways in the pandemic and see how these different ways are actually impacting the overall well-being of society. And we are also seeing similar trend uh, in these time frames. Uh, and overall, what we see in our analysis, uh, the financial factors are playing an important role. And specifically, the unemployment has been a crucial factor on the social well-being of the, of the individuals. And similarly, the business loans or the business uh, release or the individual release are also another important factors. So for this reason, we uh, thought that the policymakers may consider actually to study correlation between policy changes, uh, choices, and social health impact of the pandemic and make policies related uh, based, based on the findings uh, of, of these studies. And also public health uh, professionals may monitor and be prepared actually uh, for substantial ch changes in mental health and addiction, uh, even though actually we are coming hopefully uh, to the end of the pandemic. Uh, so the public health consequences of the pandemic may actually endure. So, um, of course, other related social services will be impacted, uh, will consider actually uh, considering uh, um, some related additional services for the individuals considering the impact of the pandemic on their well-being uh, and social quality. And thank you very much. Uh, if you have any Thank questions. you for the for the data. Um, please hold the questions till the end, but sure, please sure. type some questions in the chat. To, uh, do not forget them. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so um, our next panelist is should I pronounce Kostov or Kostov? Kostov Saha. Kostov, yeah. Kostov Saha is a senior researcher at Microsoft Research in Montreal, where he works closely with fairness and accountability, transparency, and ethics in AI, Faith Group. He recently completed his PhD in computer science from Georgia Tech, and his research interest is in social computing, computational social science, human-centered machine learning. 
his research adopts machine learning, natural language, and causal um, inference analysis to examine human behavior and well being using social media and online data, along with complementary multimodal sensing data. Uh, he published at many conferences. He's a recipient at Foley Scholarship Award and SNAP Research Fellowship. Earlier, he completed his uh, Bachelor in Computer Science and Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, uh, Karangpur, and he holds an overall industry research experience of five years. And we we'll, are curious to hear what he can share with us. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Thank it's you. really a pleasure to meet all of you. Thanks, uh, Diana, for the introduction. Uh, let me just try sharing my screen. I hope everything will be working fine. Um, um, we have it, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, um, I am uh, a senior researcher at Microsoft Research Montreal. Before this, I completed my PhD last year. And yeah, it's a pleasure to meet all of you, as I just mentioned. It's, it's I'm really um, very happy to meet all of you today. So my research has involved bringing in methods from machine learning, NLP, and causal inference to study and predict human behaviors and well-being through social media and complementary multimodal sensing data. So my presentation, um, my presentation is slightly different. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of going to motivate about social media first, and then like, give a quick overview of some of the works that we have done in the last few years, and then like, like put in some open questions that we have with predicting mental health with social media and these kinds of predictions with digital data that we have. Now, in the theme of this workshop. Uh, is around um, mental well-being, and traditionally, mental well-being is measured by surveys, which are accurate in snapshots, but rely on retrospective recall and are reactive in nature, such that they can only be conducted after an event has occurred. And therefore, research recognizes the value of in-the-moment data gathering, such as via EMAs or ecological momentary assessments. And with the advent of ubiquitous technologies, EMAs can now be incorporated by smartphones. However, this kind of sensing technologies suffer from limitations related to compliance and adds participant burden as they seek to actively engage the participants. And therefore, passive sensing modalities have become of prime interest as they do not require the participants to be actively engaged and allow us to collect the data in an unobtrusive manner. So smartphones, wearables, and social media, all due to their ubiquity and widespread use, serve as low cost and convenient passive sensing techniques. Now, I just mentioned about social media. The social media platforms enable us to share our thoughts and connect with others. And, and in this research, we bring in this perspective that social media can be used as a passive sensor to examine, uh, like examine and predict human behaviors and well-being. Now, social media data is self-recorded and self-motivated in a self-motivated fashion in one's naturalistic setting. And this data can be collected unobtrusively to obtain longitudinal and historical data even beyond study periods. Social media alternatively functions as a verbal sensor as it can actively capture people's linguistic expressions. And the social ecological model, which is the figure at the right, explains the potential of social media sensing for complex human behaviors and well being. And this model tells us that people's behaviors and experiences are not isolated and are impacted by relationships, the communities that we live in, or by events and factors in the society. I, I mean, very related to Uber's presentation, how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected different layers of, uh, uh, different layers of uh, individuals um, during the pandemic. Now, in the next few slides, I'll give a very quick overview of some of these works that we have done in this space, hoping to set, give a sense of the potential of social media in problems of different flavors. Now, I'll first talk about studies on situated communities, particularly college campuses. College campuses are close-knit, geographically situated communities, and a crisis on campus can have several individual and community-scale mental health repercussions. So in one of our studies, we studied how stress evolves following gun violence incidents on college campuses. So we built a transfer learning classifier to measure stress expressions on Reddit data, and then conducted an interpret time series based analysis. 
What we found was that stress increased immediately after gun violence, leading to reduced cognition, higher preoccupation, and higher death-related conversations. And in another work, we studied the effectiveness of counseling recommendations after student death incidents on college campuses, which is otherwise hard to evaluate. So we conducted a causal study to measure the psychosocial changes in affect behavior and cognition following counseling interventions made by the college stakeholders. Now, this work also contributes a grief lexicon modeled on Russell's circumflex model of affect. What we found was counseling interventions are indeed effective in improving psychosocial well being of college students. Now, this kind of research bears the implications towards building tools to track campus student morale and can be used to make proactive and tailored well being interventions on college campuses. Now, in another work, we adopted a causal inference method to measure the effects of antidepressants using Twitter data. Now, we identified users who self-expressed the intake of antidepressants and matched them with control users who were linguistically and behaviorally similar on Twitter. Now, we also built transfer learning classifiers of depression, anxiety, stress, and societal ideation, and examined how these changes varied after intake of these medications. In the same theme of causal inference problems, often we know the outcomes and we are interested about what were the treatments or what factors caused these outcomes. Now, for example, we know about online mental health communities and in this work we were curious like what factors are effective towards positive mental health outcomes in these online mental health communities. Now, or, or how to effectively support in these online mental health communities. Now, if we want to design online mental health communities and if we want to recommend best practices to the community members. Now, we adopted a case control based ap approach in the studies and made observations such as diversity of responses, adaptability of support, and style are important causal factors to help positive outcomes of community members. And now, very similar to the COVID-19 pandemic-related uh, mental health effects, we examine the effect changes in symptomatic mental health expressions of depression, anxiety, stress, and suicidal ideation, and seeking supportive express, uh, seeking uh, support in uh, on social media. Now, one of the findings of this work was also uh, as also revealed in the plots on the right is that compared to a control period that is from 2019 mental health expressions were much higher in the first few months of COVID-19. However, the effects uh, decreased over a period of time or what we called as adapting to the new normal. Now that we showed some of these potentials, we wanted to also evaluate the construct validity of the social media based mental health predictions. Now questions such as, are we actually measuring what we're supposed to be measuring? So we obtained ground truth data of an on-campus uh, mental health consultations data, that is monthly visits to student mental health services over a span of five years. And you know, very uh, briefly, what we did was we compared two kinds of predictive models. One model which only used historical mental health visits data, and another model which combined transfer learning based predictions of mental health on college uh, subreddits. Now we found that model including social media data outperformed the model without social media by about 41%. And the study also revealed how social media based discussions during high mental health uh, consultation months consisted of discussions related to academics and careers, whereas months of low mental health consultation saliently showed expressions of positive effect and collective identity and socialization. Now, while we saw some potential for social media data, it also comes with limitations. Like it is sparse, not everyone is equally active, and there is a lack of ground truth. Now, in our prior work, we addressed some of these limitations using complementary multimodal sensing, which helps us obtain a holistic understanding about an individual. Like leveraging EMAs or ecological momentary assessments to assess the lack of address the lack of ground truth, and multimodal passive sensing to impute mass missing social media data. Now, in very briefly, I'll explain how we use multimodal offline sensing to contextualize person-centered person predictions. Now, we typically build social media-based prediction models of the entire data set that we have. However, the social media use and language may vary tremendously across individuals. Now, while this challenge can be overcome through personalized models, 
social media data also suffers from sparsity related issues. And therefore, in this work, we balance the trade-offs between two personalized and two generalized models by contextualizing on offline behaviors as captured by a multimodal passive sensing. Now, if you see the bottom figure on contextualized approach, we built separate models of behaviorally similar individuals to predict the psychological constructs. And these models can effectively capture between individual homogeneity and within individual heterogeneity in our behaviors. Now, finally, I will end with, end with some open questions in the problems that I discussed and more generally in the problem space. These questions open up future directions to think, evaluate, and address. For example, there is a lack of understanding of ground truth. Like, what does it mean to be ground truth and how do we collect that? These assessments suffer from self selection and how do we overcome that? Also, how do we ensure that these methods uh, also benefit beyond those who can afford or use these technologies? Now, these assessments can be misused and findings can be misinterpreted to reinforce societal biases as well. We also need to think about what are the ways to navigate through the harms and benefits. And these questions are both challenges, challenging and also opportunities to strive towards building better technologies for well-being. Now we need to critically reflect and study these questions and bring together multi-stakeholder viewpoints to realize the research and practical impact. Thank you, and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your research, recent research results and publications and for the open questions. Let's come back to them. Please type more questions in the chat. Do not forget your questions and comments uh, for the audience. And I'm happy now to introduce our third panelist who is uh, Joshua Skorburg, who is an assistant professor of philosophy, academic co-director of the Center for Advancing Responsible and Ethical AI, Care AI, at the, and faculty affiliate at the One Health Institute at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. He's also a young professor in Fuqua School of Business at Duke University. He received his PhD in philosophy 2017 from University of Oregon. His research spans topics in applied ethics and moral physiology. So we please uh, share with us what you want, what you can. Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually didn't um, have any any slides to share. Um, so That's no problem at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just wasn't sure how this thing, you know, uh, this, the slide sharing can go. So I'll just talk through it. But I think I'm, I'm really glad we actually went in the order we did. Um, many of the things I wanted to bring up dovetail mm -hmm. really nicely with, with the last slide in, in Gustav's presentation. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so, um, you know, in the ethics literature, um, people looking at ethical implications of data mining on social media, um, everyone seems to agree about the importance of data privacy. Everyone seems to agree about the important of, importance of collecting informed consent and, and other areas. Um, so what I wanna do instead today is just focus my brief remarks on a different set of ethical concerns that I think has received less attention um, to date in, in the literature. So um, in some previously published work, my colleagues and I have um, identified what, what we think is an important issue in this area, and, and we've called it um, the prediction intervention gap. And so this refers to the difficulties that are faced by researchers when trying to move from machine translation, or sorry, machine predictions into um, clinical interventions. Um, and in other words, the difficulties between developing predictions and translating these in a way that demonstrably improves um, outcomes for, for people suffering from mental health issues. Um, so I'll just illustrate this prediction intervention gap with one example. So as everyone here probably knows, um, there's some classic findings in clinical psychology from Jamie Pennebaker and others, you know, showing that people experiencing depression tend to use more first person singular pronouns than um, healthy controls. Okay, so this is exactly the kind of finding from psychology that can be leveraged by lots of NLP methods to extremely accurately and extremely impressively predict um, if a user is likely to experience uh, a mental health crisis. Um, but, and this is my key argument for today, um, I think we need to be more honest and critical and aware of the fact that these predictive techniques are on their own very unlikely to lead to better interventions. And I think very often this gets assumed implicitly, right? If we can build better predictions, then we're going to improve outcomes. And so, you know, my, my claim to be discussed here today is basically that that, that gap is maybe wider than is often assumed in, in the published literature. And so to, to sort of go in depth on this a little bit, um, I can do a little detour to, to the philosophy of science, right? Like, like my training is as a philosopher. Um, and so I think the way we can explain this 
is that many NLP methods um, contribute very extremely impressively well to predictions of mental disorders, but they don't contribute to explanations of mental disorders. Okay, so in the philosophy of science, it's long been recognized that there's an asymmetrical relationship between predictions on the one hand and explanations on the other. Okay, so a good scientific explanation, um, a causal explanation, can often help us to make accurate predictions. Right, but on the other hand, a good prediction does not always lead us to make useful explanations. Okay, so you can, you know, many people here are probably familiar with, with Tal Yarconi's um, psych science paper from, I think, 2018, talking about the importance of bringing machine learning to, to psychology. And there's an excellent discussion of that asymmetry in, in that paper. Um, but I'll just use an everyday kind of average example to illustrate what I'm getting at here. All right, so barometers are really good predictors of an incoming storm. Um, they're predictors, right? But they don't explain the arrival of a storm. And this is because barometers are measuring the changes in atmospheric pressure. Um, and so the changes in pressure that barometers uh, measure, they're indicators and not causes, all right? And so this is the same with many of the linguistic features used in the social media mining literature, right? Um, they're used to make predictions. And while things like pronoun use or various semantic and syntactic features can be highly predictive, um, these features do not on their own point to novel or effective interventions for doing things like treating depression, right? Well, we can see this, right? This point is made, I think, really obvious to me anyway, when we recognize that, you know, no one would ever suggest that if you wanted to improve your depression, you should use fewer first person singular pronouns, right? No one, no one would suggest that. That just seems like totally off the wall. Um, no one thinks that would make people less depressed, right? And so I think the way we can explain that intuition that no one would ever do this is because that would be the equivalent um, of treating an indicator of mental illness rather than treating a cause of mental illness, right? So in the analogy I've been developing, that would be the equivalent, in other words, of trying to adjust one's barometer to stop an incoming storm, right? Which again, no one would ever suggest that that's a good or useful idea. And so my concern basically is, you know, as an outsider, right, as someone trained primarily as an ethicist and, and not, you know, as an AI or an ML researcher, but when I read these papers, right, I, I often feel like the gap isn't really acknowledged. Um, this gap between what it takes to develop a useful prediction on the one hand and how to translate that or to develop it into a useful intervention on the other. Um, and so I think that um, it's easy to get caught up in the hype cycles, right? Like, like there's so many of these methods that can outperform expert clinical judgment. And I wanna say like, damn, that is so impressive, right? Like I agree with that. Um, and I think we need to more critically examine um, what it takes, right? To go from those predictions to an intervention. Um, so there's a couple issues I wanna wrap up with discussing about why I think this gap is so important. So I think, you know, in many countries, when we consider um, the structural inequalities and in the funding of mental health research, I do have this worry that um, if we get more and more excited and more and more keen to develop and deploy these predictive technologies at scale, um, we could very likely end up in a situation where we're identifying more and more people as in need of support, right? People suffering from depression and anxiety precisely because of, you know, the COVID pandemic, like in the first presentation. Right, but none of that changes the fact that we often lack the tools and material resources to offer that support. Okay, so the worry in, in the kind of ethics literature I'm familiar with is that this is known as epidemiological inflation. Right, we just find more and more people suffering from these problems without any sort of correlated increase in the level of resources or funding that we have to support them. Um, so, you know, I want to suggest that while it may seem obvious that the ability to predict with, again, strikingly amazing levels of accuracy, um, the occurrence of mental health issues, um, it may seem like obvious that'll lead to clinical benefits. This is only going to be true in cases where we have treatments and resources available to support those who have been identified at high risk or who are predicted as, you know, likely to transition to some negative outcome with respect to mental health. Um, so, you know, I'll wrap up by, by considering an area that's been really interesting to me, um, and this has to do with um, uh, psychosis related conditions, right? So as everyone on this call probably knows, the papers by Betty et al in 2016, you know, predicting um, the onset of um, uh, psychosis in high risk youth is like a you know widely cited example, remarkably impressive. It's another one of these cases where the this sort of, I think that's an SVM classifier in that case, you know, outperforms the people with like 20 years of clinical training, right? So it's an amazing paper. Um, but I think that these psychosis related conditions are, are interesting when viewed in this light of, of the prediction intervention gap that I've been talking about, 
right? So on the one hand, there is evidence in the clinical literature um, that early interventions in the prodromal stages of psychosis related conditions um, can sometimes help to stave off some um, later negative outcomes, right? So, so there does seem to be some clear value in intervening early. Um, but on the other hand, you know, some of my collaborators have, have looked very carefully at the, the literature on schizophrenia for a number of years now. Um, and I think there's some pretty suggestive evidence, right, to, to suggest that, that treatments for schizophrenia haven't really improved significantly since antipsychotics were first discovered in the 1950s, even though in the 1990s we see the sec second wave of, of um, pharmaceuticals introduced. Um, rates of recovery for people diagnosed with schizophrenia have hovered around 13% for 20 or 30 years by now without significant improvement. Um, we still see that on average, people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia have a life expectancy of almost 15 years shorter than healthy controls. Um, and in recent years, there's been a lot of debate in, in the clinical literature um, about the efficacy and safety of antipsychotics, right? And so these are often, uh, antipsychotic drugs are very often touted as these early interventions, right? So if you can find someone who is likely to transition to psychosis, the earlier you can intervene and get them started on antipsychotics, right? That's often the first line of defense. This is often the standard um, sort of early intervention that, that, that is so heralded in this literature. Um, but there's increasing evidence that I don't think we can ignore that the use of antipsychotics, at least in some cases, can actually lead to an increase in psychotic symptoms over time, right? So it's certainly not straightforward that early interventions of, of giving antipsychotics are ones that are going to, in many or even most cases, lead to improved outcomes, right? Um, and so I think increasingly experts in this field uh, disagree, right, about whether these medications are actually doing more harm than good. And so I think like when we take that into consideration, right, it shows that even if these cases where we can identify someone at early risk of, of psychosis or schizophrenia, um, even if we can do that really, really well, there's still this really big problem. And it's not a machine learning problem, right? That, that we just, like, this is a, a notoriously tricky condition, right? Like we don't know how to treat it well. Um, people have been studying it for decades and not that much progress has been made. So, so you know, what do we make of this, right? And so I think, you know, again, I'm trained as a philosopher. My, my you know, my, my inclination is to say, well, it's complicated. Right, what, what we make of it. Um, but I think at the very least, I'd like to see researchers in this space being a bit more careful um, and sort of turning a more critical eye towards some of these claims that, you know, better predictions, more data leading to better predictions, therefore smoothly or straightforwardly leads to increased or improved outcomes. Um, I don't think that that's often so smooth or so straightforward, right? I think very often there's lots of unacknowledged hurdles in the way. I think there's at least some cases we can point to where, you know, owing to problems with things like epidemiological inflation or the lack of efficacy for certain pharmaceuticals, right, that early interventions can sometimes anyway do potentially more harm than good. Um, so, you know, the, the, the point I want to raise for discussion here is basically, you know, not to say we should stop doing any of this research, right? I'm, you know, again, remain as impressed as, as many of you. Um, I just think that there is a, a bigger gap than is often um, recognized or acknowledged between machine predictions on the one hand and clinical interventions on the other hand that I think we'd all do a lot better to, to heed. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there and then look forward to the, the Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, sure, a lot of discuss to discuss. Uh, I'm sure this gap exists, and um, explainable AI is also something we struggle to to get up <laughs> and going. Um, so please feel free to to um, start on the questions. There is one question on the chat. Uh, Ibrahim, if you are there, do you want to ask your question? Because if you type it in the chat. Sure. Um, Let's go ahead. Uh, listening, thank you, Diana. Thank you for, uh, to the panelists. This is very interesting. Um, I, I was just listening to the keynote and, and then also uh, Gustav here talking about self-disclosures. And I was wondering whether there's been any studies that would actually show any meaningful correlation between self-disclosures and cl clinicians' assessment of um, mental health. Thanks, Abraham. I mean, I kind of um, like wrote down it in my response in the chat, but I'll just briefly mm -hmm. go over, but I would let the other panelists speak about this as well. But I think uh, like even clinician assessments have kind of relied, especially in mental health, has also relied a lot on people's self-reports. And I think that's where people compare like why social media is effective, because it's kind of replicating what um, people expect like when patients go to clinician, their clinicians are also kind of noting down how they are speaking, what they're expressing, and kind of social media is sort of 
what people express in the naturalistic setting and sort of like verbal sensor. But but yeah, I mean that I mean there have been studies which kind of compared social media predictions with people's self-reported data and also kind of also com combined the clinician expert judgments in these kinds of predictions. Um, I mean, there, can, there could be other forms of like ground truth as in like, for example, in that, like I compared um, the social media based predictions of mental health with monthly visits to campus mental health uh, care. Um, so, so like there are different forms of um, this kind of ground truth and uh, like what can be uh, predicted through social media, but again, like goes back to the question, like how much accurate this is, how much effective this is, how much this actually translates from theory to care. I mean, I would bring back, I mean, I, that was very much um, informative to me about the prediction uh, intervention gap. I think um, that is very relevant here as well. And questioning this like ground truth, questioning the efficacy, questioning how do we translate from theory to practice. I think these are very important in these kinds of uh, predictions and obviously the ethical questions about but yeah i mean like clinicians kind of also look for this complementary information that is hard or like more real time and longitudinal information which is kind of hard to get through uh, like other forms so i think that's why like there is, there are potentials but also um there are harms uh, and other forms of challenges but yeah i would like the other panelists comment on this as well um, thank you very much. There is something in the chat also from Nasli that, that is also important to pay attention if self-reported is a target opinion or is indicated. Oh, I can see the rest of the chat. Um, if self-reported is a target's opinion or is it indicated a diagnosis by a medical doctor? I think I have X versus my doctor diagnosed me with X. Thank you, Nasli. Yes. So this is a reported diagnosis or an impression of the person. Um, uh, there was a, a question in the chat. Prasadit, you had the hand, uh, hand raised. Comment on this or different question? Uh, thank you, Professor. Just uh, a question from Kausta. Uh, just uh, because, like, uh, it's really we see like the Sarima models. I just wanted to know what sort of like features uh, Kausta have used uh, with, like, obviously it's a multivariate analysis kind of a thing, but. What features or variables were used, Professor, for just to do the Sagma analysis with time series in the uh, with uh, his research? Thank uh, you. For the most of the mental health uh, prediction data with social media, uh, including this one, I used uh, engrams and other forms of linguistic features, some of the behavioral features, uh, Luke features that, uh, made by Penny Baker and his team about um, like uh, which have like different psycholinguistic um, like dictionaries of language and otherwise like open vocabulary and graphs are also predictive of different mental health uh, metra attributes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so back to the previous discussion on uh, explainability, there is this e-risk task on BDI questionnaire, back depression index, and they are trying to see if people sleep, how do people sleep, how they eat, how they do social activities. So I'm thinking maybe this kind of explanation, if it could be included, but the results on that task are very low. It's very hard for a computer to actually get this information. And uh, there is self-report self there, but there's no clinical data on that task, but at least there is self-report versus social media. Um, any, oh, Natalie, you wanted to add something? Yes, hi. Uh, Go ahead. Thanks to all the panelists. Uh, to the point of goals, which, um, Definitely, that is a, a really important notion. Uh, but I think that exactly, uh, it is something that this causality, uh, it's something that it is everywhere. I mean, mental health, uh, physical health. If somebody is obese, um, we can see the person is obese or we can detect the person is obese. What led to the person to be obese? That is something that in the physical, in the, in the healthcare documents of this doctor, uh, which unfortunately they're also not connected all. The history of that patient is also as moves to here or there might also be incomplete. Now put that into the social media. Social media, a person joins, 
post something or not. And that is all we know. We don't know all other issues, physical and mental health of this person. We don't have the records of this person. There is no history of that person and it is based on what we hear. I think that uh, I cannot actually see uh, if it will be a perfect solution. I think we are trying to do things we can do by doing some prediction, giving some uh, indication as much as we can. It has to be uh, ultimately that uh, interdisciplinary. It has to be that doctor or counselor or somebody who knows the history of the patient. But uh, do we get to that ideal situation I, as stands, it is not, right? That causality, it's important notion, uh, which it is missing from almost all of the social media findings. So going back to what God said. Thank you. Any comments on this topic before we move to the next the question on the chat? Yeah, I mean, maybe I could just jump in because I think it's, it's related to the comment in the chat and it's, it's worth talking about. Um, you know, one of the things that I really think about is that, like, I'm really convinced on the one hand, like, you know, so, so my wife's a clinical psychologist. Um, my father-in-law's a psychiatrist, so stuff runs in the family for me. And it's striking hearing about their practice, right? That they might see someone once a month, or in the case of my father-in-law, it's like you might see someone once every six months, right? And so what you get in these 15 minute med checkups, you know, it's nothing, right? It's just, a, it's a small little sliver of this person's life. So I'm so much like, given that context in favor of many of the methods described here to just fill in all those gaps, because there's so many gaps in our overburdened mental health system. Um, but then the tension that I always try to struggle with when I'm reading these papers and thinking about these issues is, you know, I think that sometimes patients, um, if we want to respect their autonomy, right, they do have a right not to share things with their providers, right? And so, um, and maybe for good reason, right? Maybe they've had negative experiences with institutionalized forms of healthcare, and so they prefer to go on a subreddit, right, right rather than to, to go to a clinic. And so, on the one hand, I see the tremendous value about filling in these gaps, right? But on the other hand, I often worry that like if we're sort of respecting patients' autonomy fully, right? Um, is it ethical to sort of extract these features from, you know, posts on subreddits, for example, where people might go there, right? Precisely because they don't want to be interacting with researchers, precisely because they don't want to take part in these studies. Um, and so I don't have any easy answers to that, right? I mean, it's, it's a very tricky question. And so for me, like those, you know, uh, to what degree should we respect people's right um, to not disclose things is one that it's a very, very thorny issue, I think, in, in this space. And so so I hope that relates a little bit to, to Nasli, to, to your point, and then also to the question in the chat as well. I would like to chime in uh, at this point. Um, so uh, I, I completely agree with Gus at this point, because there's a, a huge social stigma attached to this uh, mental health issues and people are not comfortable enough to share this particular conditions or circumstances that they are going through even with their providers even with their doctors and uh, for this reason uh, apart from social media data even the clinical notes or clinical records for a patient uh, may not actually include all of the indicators uh, related to the mental health condition of a patient so uh, on the other hand, so th the, the main issue is the social stigma attached to the identity of the person, uh, what kind of person they are, and they may not be willing to share all these details related to, to their conditions. On the other hand, uh, so the type of social media platform can actually uh, open up these discussions and people may feel more comfortable uh, when they don't have to share their identity, who they are in, in real life. For example, in Reddit, so they don't have to share their identity, their sh share their name or any type of personal detail, so they can go anonymous like throughout the process. So um, I, in this particular case, uh, social media data, like a Reddit data, for example, may be more uh, useful at some point or in some cases uh, compared to other social media platforms. It can be uh, complementary to like uh, clinical uh, clinical records for patients as well, because people are going to be more comfortable sharing their data because they, they are known to other people. They are not known to other people. But of course, a, a, a psychologist could have consent or not. So the patient has okay. the right to not give consent. Sure. sure. 
Um, there was some discussion in the chat. Uh, if you want Q Liang to summarize, your question was more about the recovery for drug addiction, and do you want to follow up on that? Or hi, Diana. Good morning. Hi. Go ahead. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to uh, echo Gus's remark and um, some of these other panelists' comments about um, the importance of using uh, social media data that's self-motivated and self-reported to kind of complement complement that picture of clinical values. Uh, where, I, I come, where I come from, I actually use uh, electronic health records of substance use treatment patients. And what I realized is that the clinical values that are uh, perceivably accurate in electronic health records are not, not necessarily so reflecting how patients are really doing. Um, um, so the counselors uh, usually talk, speak to how they say that, for example, uh, a patient say, says that they're motivated um, to stay on recovery, but um, they end up not going to the recommended treatment sessions. So there's that tension between what they say and their actions. So I think being able to capture that actions um, in some dimensions from an NLP approach, uh, what, what have you, with the uh, ecological momentary assessment could be uh, potential and, and promising. Uh, and also, I just wanted to ask Gus, what was that paper that he mentioned? I want to read that. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, in please type it in the chat, yes. Yeah. Uh, so many open questions. Uh, any more? Which ones we can address in the remaining time? Uh, more comments, more questions, please. Another thing that I would like to chime in is that, uh, like, uh, like we also need to think about the harms and going back to the previous discussion as well. Like, for example, um, like, like these mental health predictions can models can be misused in several ways. Like, insurance companies or targeted advert advertisers can target individuals, and that can lead to different forms of triggers and other forms of marginalization and challenges as well. And and also, like, does it also, we kind of need to rethink and re-question ourselves that does it, like social media was never really created for the purposes of understanding or predicting someone's mental health. But now if we start measuring in the real world, would that kind of change our behaviors or use of the social media platforms? Like, like I think going back to uh, Gus's comment on, I, it, it was really interesting that um, like use of social, uh, like first person pronouns and prediction of depression. I mean, like if now people are aware that they, they are being assessed, they are being monitored all the time, will they be changing their behaviors on social media platforms? Will they not express then um, compared to what they would have likely expressed? So that's why it's a, like a very important kind of going back, like asking the questions about the purposes of social media. Are we actually affecting or influencing the use of social media through these uh, kind of predictions and monitoring? And if they're kind of brought into practice that these algorithms, will they have these kinds of effects as well? Yeah, I just want to echo that that's because the worry is like some about some kind of weird kind of autocorrelation, right, where you sort of, I mean, so I think about this all the time with with sort of the personality research, like some of it that, that, that you hinted at, um, you know, if it's the case that some of the newsfeed algorithms are being designed with things like big five personality traits in mind to mm -hmm. drum up more engagement, and then all of a sudden you're, you know, trying to see, oh, can we predict big five personality traits from someone's social media post? Well, that's just like autocorrelation, right? Like that was the thing that was used. So it's just kind of like can have these weird sort of feedback loop effects um, that are really, I mean, it's really hard to study that, right? It's like really hard to quantify that. And I think I had this intuition that that probably does happen with mental health, but I would have no idea how to measure that or, or how to, you know, show that that is a worry that people are behaving differently and knowing that or, or posting differently, right? knowing that it might be taken up in a mental health context. Yeah, social media phenomenon is complicated, but since it's here, we need to, you know, be aware of everything that's going on. Other comments, questions? What about the COVID um, in, in, impact? Was it like really bigger gap? And why was it different in different parts of the US? I have a hard time understanding the social realities, <laughs> I guess. Uh, the, the question was for me. Yes, for you, for you, Anguri. Uh, so uh, would you mind repeating again? Uh, so how big was the impact of COVID on the mental health according to your measurement? And why the difference between different clusters of US states? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, the difference was 
in our uh, uh, observations from the data, uh, so the governments are uh, they have responded in, in a different manner to the to the pandemic. For example, the timeline of the government response was actually different in each state. So, for example, some of the states actually very they were very prompt and they were very quick to introduce uh, interventions, state state home orders, and also uh, business relief uh, packages and also individual relief packages. Uh, and and they some some of the states were actually very late for for this and uh, the impact of these uh, of these external events uh, over the people actually uh, act, uh, exacerbated uh, the impact of COVID nineteen pandemic even more. So for this reason, so for example, uh, in the first week or the second week of the of the pandemic, uh, so. Florida actually were actually late to introduce the uh, the measure measures for uh, stay at home orders or shelter in place, but on the other hand, California was very quick to introduce those uh, those uh, government responses. So uh, the these two states were actually very different in terms of the impact of the of the COVID nineteen pandemic and uh, and and mental health issues or social well being. So, uh, so government responses actually were critical uh, in in the difference in the distinction between these days, as far as we could see, uh, and the measurements that we that we did uh, the associations between uh, financial factors and also government response with the uh, social well-being of the of society also showed this uh, uh, relationship between two uh, two factors in different states. I see. Any other comments, questions? Yeah, so sorry, we don't have a lot of time because so many open questions, uh, And uh, but it's still good to have them out in the open and then people can follow up. We have PhD students who need for good topics to research. Uh, it's plenty in computer science and especially in the interdisciplinary approaches as much as, as, as we can deal with them. Any other uh, comments, questions that somebody wants to share in the next few minutes? <clears throat> if not, thank you very much to the three panelists. Uh, Bill, please feel free to add anything, last, uh, last closing remarks if you have any pressing thoughts. Uh, Thank you very much for the discussion, all, all of you, and um, the attendance, of course. And again, thank you very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed uh, being on the panel with Kos and Kos, and also with other uh, uh, participants, uh, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you all, and uh, let's, let's keep the, the research going, and uh, let's uh, get back to the organizers for the next session. Thank you again to the panelists and to the attendees and to organizers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Burke. This was very informative and very engaging session. I really Agreed. Agree. And thanks for posting that paper. So the, the one you just put, I, I can't wait to read that. I just, I'm actually probably going to go read it now. So, so it, was, it was very, very good for my end. So thanks for the invitation as well for time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Becca. We can move on to the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. Thank you for moderating the panel. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, the next part. Uh, we have two more accepted papers. Um, the first one is uh, entitled Supporting People Receiving substance use treatment during COVID-19 through a professional moderated online peer support group. It will be presented by um, o, um, Estella Liang. So are you available right now? Hi, yeah. uh, yes, I am. So are you uh, ready to present first? Yeah, I can do that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, you can share your screen. Do you see my screen okay? Yes. Awesome. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is O. Stella Liang. I'm a PhD candidate in information science at the Drexel University College of Computing and Informatics. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. And on behalf of my collaborators from the College of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry at Drexel to uh, present to you this preliminary study results uh, from um, really just utilizing a common social media platform to support people with uh, substance use disorders during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, so just really brief background, we know that um, the, opioid, opi the opioid overdose death has really um, spiked during the COVID-19 period by as much as 28.5%. And um, physically, a lot of the uh, outpatient treatment groups have to uh, move to online space. So a lot of in-person group therapy, which is very important for substance use treatment, um, was either canceled or moved online and the participation uh, is not as uh, stable because of people's uh, internet uh, access. Um, so what do we know uh, about uh, substance use and uh, stress during COVID-19 um, that informs us to design the study? We know that acute stress could lead to substance use relapse. Um, we also know that loneliness had increased for some people during COVID-19 and uh, allevi alleviating loneliness could actually lower the chance of relapse among substance use patients. Um, also, we know that uh, one very uh, important tool in uh, not just substance use, but also other mental uh, chronic, chronic health diseases is uh, peer support uh, that is recognized by the WHO um, for um, really encouraging people to sustain their po positive healthy be health behaviors after treatment. Um, so uh, speaking of peer support, uh, online peer support groups or OPSC uh, has uh, emerged in recent decade to uh, basically uh, take the space that people can con congregate online regardless of where they are and be able to share their personal experience and lived insights, some of which actually uh, are only unique to the patients, not the providers. So OPSC has uh, emerged as a important resource for people who um, either don't have access to a mental health treatment or um, prefer talking with you know, people in the online space. Um, and then some of the more um, refined research on OPSC is you know, talking about the differentiation between named OPSC versus uh, anonymous forums. Uh, named OPSC, what comes to mind is, you know, uh, social media is like Facebook, where you have a um, picture and the name. And so it seems that named OPSC may be uh, better able to engage participants than anonymous forums, but uh, there is that tension that stigma stigmatized conditions may be harder to talk to when you are attaching your name to that um, disease or condition. Um, so there's more to be understood about how for um, things like substance use, which is uh, a stigmatized condition still in the society, uh, whether named OPSC could help. Uh, another uh, study showed that professionally moderated OPSC could ensure better content quality and reduce the risk of misinformation for the participants, and which is pretty self-explanatory. So with all that information in mind, we decided to recruit some participants um, from an outpatient substance use treatment clinic in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, USA. And um, we specifically collected uh, three baseline measures, um, uh, loneliness, online support, and COVID-19 impact. And so these are self-report uh, psychological scales that are uh, collected by research staff via phone interviews. And um, these participants were invited to join a private Facebook group uh, where the substance use counselors and staff were posting weekly recovery topics that are actually in sync with their um, uh, outpatient group therapy topics, as well as wellness, wellness related topics and daily motivational messages. 
um, this preliminary study ran for three months uh, during September to December 2020. That was at the height of the pandemic uh, here in the US. Uh, preliminary results that we had, uh, 13 women participated in this preliminary study um, with a mean age of 40 by the wide uh, range of um, age span. And um, these patients, participants generated 53 posts. If you think about three months, 90 days, that's not a lot of posts. Um, they did make more comments and, and, and likes. Um, so we could see here that uh, participants were more likely to make comments and likes comparing to uh, making an original post of their own. Um, so this is probably the most interesting finding of the preliminary study where we saw that uh, participants, uh, so we counted the number of comments and likes they made towards different post types, including the weekly recovery topics, uh, as well as the daily motivational messages. So these two are basically posted by the staff and the uh, professional counselors and the peer posts are their uh, own originated um, messages. So what we could see here is that people were more likely to respond uh, thoughtfully to a weekly recovery topic posted by the counselor that they already know um, and are familiar with. And with the motivational messages, they tend to um, click on like, um, but without saying much. And the peer posts are sort of just in the middle. They weren't getting a lot of comments um, and the likes are um, uh, you know, on average 0.4 per post. Um, and uh, last but not least, as far as the psychological, psychological measure goes, uh, after three months of enrollment, we did see a, a decrease in their loneliness as well as an increase in their online social support. And, uh, but because the study sample is too small, we didn't run the statistical comparison on it. Uh, we also was able to uh, see that at the baseline level, for those who reported higher level of loneliness, also reported that they felt a greater impact from the pandemic, as well as uh, feeling more isolated. Um, so discussions and future steps. I think the study, this preliminary study, very small. Uh, we couldn't really do much um, data mining, so to speak, which I know it's the theme of this uh, workshop, but what we were able to see that was that it seems that professionally moderated OPSCs could be more effective in engaging participation. Um, and uh, as far as you know, what future steps are, we, we asked the question, so what factors actually contributed to the reduced loneliness, assuming it's gonna be uh, significant? And so the first question is, you know, is because we saw increased online social support, um, among these group of participants, but a lot of them were actually just silent participants. They may see the post, but they didn't make any uh, participation. So is that form of participation actually uh, helpful for, for those that are in the group? And another question is potential confounders. Um, so the next uh, approach, the next step we're doing, we're pursuing right now is actually running a larger scale study that it has like two arms, the intervention arm and the control arms, sort of like a randomized control trial that could potentially um, help us control for the confounders, whether they are in treatment um, or like, you know, are they a better like internet user to begin with? Um, another um, question is whether OPIC ultimately is, in fact, is effective in improving treatment outcomes. So now we have seen little tendency that OPSC is effective in improving um, their mental well-being in terms of reducing loneliness, but does that actually translate into the treatment outcomes that we like to see, which is um, people being able to stay in recovery longer. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody and it's great um, to participate in this workshop and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for your great work and presentation. So any questions from uh, audience? Okay, I have a question. You know, um, is there any similar study done before a starting pandemic? 
Um, and, you know, I was just curious to know what's the impact of um, COVID-19 on the, you know, users' engagement? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I had uh, previously analyzed uh, substance use related conversations on, on other social media platforms uh, such as MedHelp, it's like an anonymous uh, health firm. Um, but that's a really good point in terms of like, comparing their participation patterns once they are sort of isolated in a staying at home environment. I'll definitely follow up on that. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, um, is there any other question? Okay, you can leave uh, your questions on chat um, if you have any. Okay, our last um, accepted paper is also related to COVID-19 pandemic. It's entitled Utilizing Pattern Mining and Classification Algorithms to Identify Risk for Anxiety and Depression in the LGBTQ plus community during the COVID-19 pandemic. It will be presented by uh, Josephine, right? Or so would you uh, introduce yourself and your group and share your screen? Thank you. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm Josephine Bierbaum. Um, oops, looks like I have the wrong screen here. Let's see. Can you see my presentation here? Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, we're from Gustavus Adolphus College um, and I have my colleague Melissa on the call as well. Um, and so our goal was utilizing pattern mining and classification algorithms to identify the risk for anxiety and depression in the LGBTQ plus community during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we were working with a data set from Hornet and Hornet is a gay social network with over 25 million users worldwide. Um, and this data was collected by a COVID-19 disparity survey administered by Hornet. And they collected data between April 16th, 2020 and May 4th, 2020. And this was a 58 question survey. Um, it had a couple questions on a few different things um, being demographics. So including their race and their gender, uh, mental health. These include things like if they had little interest in doing things, um, how, how happy were they um, and other things during this time. And then it also looked at the impacts of COVID-19 on their well-being. Um, so looked at if the government was restricting their movement during COVID, as well as if their salary or income was impacted by COVID and how they were able to meet their needs um, during COVID as well. And the first algorithm that we used on this data set was FP growth. And FP growth is an algorithm that was developed by Han et al. in 2004. And what this algorithm does is it uses pattern fragment growth to mine all frequent item sets. Um, and a simpler way of saying this is that it produces association rules, which use the presence of some items, which we call our antecedents, to predict the presence of another item, which we call our consequent. Um, and there are three measures that we get for these patterns, which is the support, which is how often the pattern occurs in the data set, um, the confidence, which is how often the association rule um, is true. And then we're also looking at lift, which is how often these antecedents and the consequent occur together compared to if they were statistically independent. Uh, so here we have our first table here. These are our association rules for anxiety. I mean, there are several of them. This is just a small subset of what we had. Um, so as you can see here, we have all of our antecedents. Um, our consequent is anxiety, and then we have our confidence, lift, and support. And I'll just go through a couple of these rules um, just to show you how to kind of interpret these rules. Um, so for that first row there, um, we're looking at for the confidence. This means that about 37% of people who needed benefits um, had universal health care and did not use drugs had anxiety. And for the lift, we're looking at someone having anxiety given that they needed benefits, had universal health care, and did not use drugs, is about 1.89 times more likely than if they were statistically independent. And then for the support, we're looking at about um, 9% of people in our data set needed benefits, had universal health care, uh, and did not use drugs, and also had anxiety. Um, and then just to give you some more time to look at this um, chart, I'll just go through the second one as well. 
Um, so for that second one there, we're looking at 33% of people uh, who needed benefits were a citizen of the country they were residing in during this time um, and did not use drugs, had anxiety. For the lift, we're looking at someone having anxiety given that they needed benefits, were a citizen of the country they were residing in during the survey um, and did not use drugs, um, were 1.74 times um, more likely to have anxiety than is statistically independent. And then for the support, we're looking at about 8% of people in our data set needed benefits, were a citizen of the country they were in while taking the survey um, and did not use drugs, had anxiety. Um, and next, we're looking at the same idea with depression. So these are our uh, association rules for depression. Um, and I will also be going through just two of these just to give you some time to just look at the different patterns in this table. Uh, so for the first one there, we had about 29% of people who did not receive benefits uh, texted as a form of communication and had health insurance, had depression. And for Lyft, someone who um, had depression and used texting for their, or sorry, uh, did not receive benefits for the communication, or did not receive benefits, used texting as their form of communication, and how health insurance is 1.27 times more likely to occur than, than if it was statistically independent. And then for our support, about 8.7% of people in our data set did not receive benefits, used texting for their communication, uh, had health insurance, and also had depression. And then I'll just go through the second one as well, just to give you some more time to look at this table here. Um, so for our confidence, we're looking at 29% of people uh, who use texting as a communication um, and did not partake in sex work um, had depression. For our lift here, about 1.27, uh, sorry, uh, someone with depression um, who is using texting for the communication and did not use sex work is about 1.27 times uh, more likely to have depression than if it was statistically independent. Um, and then we're also looking at for support that about 12% of people in our data set um, used texting for communication, did not use sex work, um, and also had depression. Uh, so the next algorithm that we used on this data set was decision trees. And so our goal is to predict that target variable, which is anxiety or depression, um, with some simple decision rules on these features. And so what we did is we trained a decision tree algorithm to make trees that classify if someone has anxiety or depression. And this isn't meant to diagnose anyone. Um, we recognize that obviously mental health professionals, it's their role to diagnose people. So the goal of these trees is to just identify the likelihood or the risk of someone having anxiety or depression. And our goal was to make a simple and interpretable tool to identify those at increased risk um, for the potential to be used by practitioners um, or other mental health professionals. So here you can see our first decision tree here. This is our decision tree for anxiety. Um, and the one thing you'll probably notice right off the bat is the colors. Um, so that blue color is if someone has a likelihood of having anxiety that is less than 50%. And then the orange is if someone has a likelihood of having anxiety that is greater than 50%. Um, and as you can notice in each of these cells, uh, depending on if someone uh, has or does not um, have that condition, um, then that likelihood changes as we go through this tree. Um, so I'll just go through one as an example. Uh, so starting out in this tree, um, everyone has a likelihood of 35.78% of having anxiety. Um, and so then if we look at that first node there, not cutting meals, if we say that that's true and they are not cutting meals, um, then they have a likelihood of 29.87% of having anxiety. So we can see a decrease in that likelihood there. Um, and then if they were to answer that they are not worried about health care discrimination due to sexuality or, or gender, and that's true, um, then they would have a likelihood of about 23.98%. Um, so we can see a decrease there again as well. Um, and then if they were to answer they are dissatisfied with their sex life, then we can see that go um, over to not anxious uh, with a like with final likelihood of 30.77%. And so then if we were to go down that tree, um, starting from the root again, we would see that then that likelihood would go from about 35% and increase to 58%. Um, so depending on the decisions in these trees, we can see that likelihood of anxiety um, fluctuate and increase or decrease. Similarly, we have a decision tree for depression. Um, and this tree has another um, layer, the depth is one larger. Um, and this is because we use cross-validation to determine the optimal depth of these trees. 
And it's the same thing here where the orange is people who have a likelihood of depression greater than 50%, and the blue is for people who have a likelihood of less than 50% for having depression. Um, so similarly here, if we were to go through this tree, everyone starts with the likelihood of 41% of having depression. And we can see we have that same um, item there at the root. So if it's true that someone's not cutting meals, um, then we can see that likelihood decrease to 34.86%. Um, and then if they were to answer true to not being worried about healthcare discrimination, then we can see that likelihood decrease again to 27.97%. Um, and then if they were to agree with that, that they are dissatisfied with their sex life, then we can see that likelihood increase to 37%. Um, and then if that's true that they are less than uh, 34 years old, then we can see that likelihood increase again to about 47%. Um, so then similarly, if we were to go um, false for that root node, then we would see an increase uh, in the risk of depression from 41 to about 84 per, or 64%. Um, and so that's how we would intend these trees to be used is for someone to follow through um, the root all the way to one of these leaps here um, to just find a, a likelihood of depression or anxiety. And so then finally, in conclusion, um, our findings can help to identify the risk of mental health concerns for individuals in the LGBTQ plus community. And our goal is for these results to be used for making a simple and interpretable tool that practitioners could potentially used to identify those at increased risk for anxiety or depression. And then additionally, our results may provide insight to help policymakers in public health make decisions on issues concerning the mental health of individuals in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, then thank you. If you have any questions for us, we'd love to hear them. Thank you so much. Thank you for your great presentation. So I see that Melissa is also here available as another author of this paper. Melissa, do you wanna introduce yourself and talk a little bit, little bit about your um, paper and your findings? Um, so I think Josie covered in the presentation, but I'm Melissa Lynn, also from uh, Gustavus Adolphus College. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Okay, I just, um, you know, um, so first any questions from audience? I think we can take two or more questions. Okay, I have a question. You know, um, in your decision tree, you labeled uh, users with uh, depression and non-depression, right? So um, how did you um, identify the risk of anxiety? So you mean anxiety is the same as depression? or you had different, I mean, they are different. Yes, yeah, so we did. Um, we trained this model on um, anxiety and depression separately. Um, so for the depression model, it's looking at if they have anxiety or do not have anxiety, or depression or not have depression. And then the anxiety is the same thing. It's if they have anxiety or do not have anxiety. So you're, um, okay. So you're, so would you um, talk a little bit more about the, your data set i mean your users are labeled with um anxiety as well or it's i mean your work is just limited to depression um so it's on anxiety and depression um they were surveyed on the questions from the phq4 um so that includes items like little interest happiness um pleasure in doing things um and they rate those on a scale from one to five i believe and then we converted those using that scale to determine if they had anxiety or not, and then if they had depression or not. Um, so we're training it on two different things. Right. Yeah, so that so are is, oh, sorry. Uh, no, the PHP-4 no, no. is what is used by um, uh, doctors to uh, help diagnose depression and anxiety. And so there's a set of questions on there for anxiety and a set of questions for depression. Um, so uh, constructed those features from those questions. Right. But two separate classifiers are trained, right? I mean, there is no one classifier to identify both of them. It's not a, a multi yes, exactly. classifier, right? It's a binary. Yep, exactly. We had two different classifiers. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking of having, you know, a classifier, actually a multi label classifier mm -hmm. to identify both of them with one model. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. It's uh, um, very um, 
valuable work. Okay, thank you everybody. Any other questions from the audience? I want to make an observation. Um, definitely a very interesting study. And I saw that the results with the decision tree for anxiety, um, like there are like orange boxes on the bottom of the page, basically, I think both leaves end up having anxiety. I thought that was really interesting. Um, could you, uh, the speakers talk about sort of reflecting on the explainability part of the um, this exercise and uh, what would you make of uh, uh, like a decision tree, decision tree rule that it's not necessarily like intuitive. Yeah, so um, some of the rules on here that we found um, are things that without data mining, you wouldn't really think of um, our rules that would increase or decrease someone's risk for anxiety or depression. Um, and I can actually quickly look at an example too. Um, so I guess one that we thought was a little interesting is um, the likelihood if someone um, is dissatisfied with their sex life actually changes depending on where you're looking at it in the tree. Um, so depending on the previous question someone's answered, that may change. Um, and we also, looking at the association rules, it's very similar to of there's a lot of association rules of things that you wouldn't really think go together um, to increase or decrease our, that are have a consequence of depression or anxiety. Um, so we thought that was interesting as well. So I guess that's where our findings are more helpful is because we know certain things are associated with anxiety or depression or make someone more likely, um, but to look at some of those things together and see the chain of events of based on the previous questions or based on those previous nodes, how that affects the likelihood. And the decision tree is based on the raw features from that survey, not from the, um, the first experiment, correct? Yes, exactly. Um, we did look at using those association rules from FP Growth to do some feature selection for the trees, um, but we found that that didn't significantly change um, or affect the accuracy of the decision trees at all. Great work, thank you. Yeah, great work. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have, uh, we can take one more question, if any. We have two minutes. Okay, so if you don't have any question, I think um, we can end this session. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And it was a great uh, session. And uh, our next session, we have um, our second keynote, um, and it will start in one hour. So you have enough time for uh, break. Thanks again, and um, I hope to see you, everybody, in the next session. Hello everyone, hope you enjoyed the workshop so far. This is our last session. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our second invited speaker, Dr. D. Chowdhury, who is going to talk to us about employing social media to improve mental health. Dr. D. Chowdhury is an associate professor of interactive computing at Georgia Tech. She's best known for laying the foundation of a new line of research that develops computational techniques towards understanding and improving mental health outcomes through ethical analysis of social media data. To do this work, she adopts a highly interdisciplinary approach combining social computing machine learning and natural language analysis with insights and theories from the social, behavioral, and health sciences. She has been recognized with the 2021 ACMW Rising Star Award, 2019 Complex Systems Society Junior Scientific Award, numerous best paper and honorable mention awards from the ACM and triple AI and features and coverage in popular press like the New, uh, New York Times, the NPR and the BBC. Dr. D. Chaudhry currently serves on the board of directors of the International Society for Computational Social Science and on the 
a steering committee of the International Conference on Web and Social Media, the leading conference on interdisciplinary studies of social media. Earlier, she was a faculty associate with the Berkeley Kelvin Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, a postdoc at Microsoft Research, and obtained her PhD in computer science from Arizona State University. Let's welcome Dr. Di Chaudhry. So all is yours. So whenever you are ready, you can start your presentation. Thank you so much, Patin. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to have this opportunity to speak with you today. And I really appreciate you sticking around till the very last session of uh, the workshop. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'll, I'll review some of the work that we have been doing uh, at the intersection of social media and mental health over the past few years. What we have seen to have worked, worked in this space, what has been successful, but importantly also what is missing and how can we move forward. Um, I'm going to be concluding my talk, maybe hopefully with some directions for future research that is in alignment with um, the goals and purposes of uh, this workshop. Before I get started, I would note that um, this presentation does have some content warning. I will be um, talking about mental health broadly speaking, but also there will be just some descriptions of serious mental illness and self-harm. So one of the things that uh, is probably very central to this workshop and also broadly to the motivation of this talk today is that we have digital trace data that we are gathering every day um, that are left behind by millions of people worldwide. I'm particularly talking about uh, people's digital data online and on social media platforms. And as we all know, over the past, I would say 15 years or so, we have seen um, new types of research especially interdisciplinary work that has emerged um, that has made many important strides into uh, improving our understanding of a variety of different kinds of um, social phenomena and understandings of human behavior. Um, so to just give you some um, quick examples, these data have now provided us new ways to measure our social interactions that are happening on these platforms. It allows us to understand our moods and emotions, our political ideologies, our collective action, and most relevant to this talk today, our health and well-being. So the initial part of this talk, um, I'm going to go through some very quick examples, which will highlight some of the work that my collaborator students and myself, we have been um, conducting that showcases the computational views of social media data for mental health. Um, the way I'm going to structure this uh, initial conversation is in two different ways. First of all, we know that for the last uh, over two years, we have been experiencing various global crises. In fact, the pandemic is still not quite over. Um, and the second um, way I'm going to motivate my talk um, is using the social ecological model. So using the social ecological model, I'm going to give you some examples of computational uses of social media data at the individual level, at the community level, and at the population level. And I'm going to situate those examples in the context of various global and local crises. So what can we understand or say at the individual level? So here's an example of some work that we did um, early on in, in um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And one thing we noticed from the very early days of the pandemic is that if you think about today's uh, digital age, um, of course, there are um, crises that happen and have a direct impact on people's lives. But at the same time, we see that these crises are accompanied by oftentimes misleading information that circulates widely online and on um, social media platforms. So these types of misinformation are likely having uh, a considerable uh, indirect impact on people because these people are being exposed to um, non-credible, inaccurate information. And what can be a better example of the harmful effects of uh, misinformation than the ongoing pandemic? So what we did in this work is we studied how exposure to misinformation, which we uh, measured here as uh, people's sharing behaviors on social media platforms, we wanted to understand how that impacts their psychological well-being. 
So to answer this, uh, to address this research goal, we conducted a large scale observational study. This was based on a propensity score matching causal framework, um, and it used 80,000, um, 80 million Twitter postings that were made by 80,000 Twitter users over the first uh, 18 months of the pandemic. So the question is, what did we find about this association? We found that people who shared uh, COVID-19 misinformation um, on Twitter, they experienced approximately two times additional increases in their anxiety levels when compared to other Twitter users who did not share misinformation around COVID-19. But what was even more interesting and revealing to us were the sociodemographic analysis. And these analysts told us that female Twitter users, racial minorities, and those Twitter users who demonstrated lower levels of education uh, in, the, in their writing, they experienced disproportionately higher increases in their anxiety levels when compared to other Twitter users. What the study uh, tells us is that it provides new types of evidence. It, it allows us to better understand and augment the efforts that, as we know, many social media platforms today are facing um, around moderating misinformation, um, including around COVID-19, and at the same time thinking about its adverse effects. What this work tells us is that for the individual, there might be opportunities to think about what could be appropriate interventions, corrections, and so on, and not just attempts to um, uh, stop spread of misinformation in these networks, but also think about and uh, mitigate its adverse impacts, particularly on well-being. So what can we say at the context of communities? So in this um, project, uh, as an example, we looked at a particular type of a situated community. Uh, these were college campuses, essentially situated communities are um, sets of people, groups of people who um, are geographically co-located and often have a shared identity or um, a shared experience over a longitudinal period of time. What we wanted to understand in this work was uh, to use social media as a way to quantify and examine stress responses that follow gun violence incidents in college campuses, which unfortunately, as we know, have been a pretty common phenomena in many college campuses in the United States. So we focused on 12 incidents of campus gun violence uh, over a five year period. And then we gathered social media data, particularly data shared on subreddits, um, that corresponded to each of these 12 schools. We developed um, an interrupted time series approach. Um, and what we found is that there were actually, probably expectedly, amplified levels of stress that followed these violent incidents. But then what was less obvious to us was the way these stress responses deviated from the usual stress patterns that you would expect to see on a campus. We also found that there were many distinct temporal and linguistic uh, changes that characterized these populations in the aftermath of these incidents. And these included signs of reduced cognition, higher self-preoccupation, and death-related uh, conversations that highly increased in a short period of time following these incidents. So we all know um, those of us who are associated with college campuses in some shape or form or have been, is that stress is a is a consistent, is a persistent well-being challenge um, on college campuses and especially to college students. And it impacts you know, their personal lives, social, academic lives, and so on. But what this work tells us is that in addition to a chronic stress, these types of violent crisis or violent incidents on campuses, they may actually aggravate students' experience of stress because they induce fear, they induce trauma, and other negative responses. Um, Although actual gun violence incidents may directly impact a small handful of students, but what our findings here tell us is that the broader community in many ways is impacted by these incidents and that impact persists for several weeks uh, following um, the gun violence incidents. So what this study tells us is that it allows us and provides us an opportunity to think about what could be interventions that could happen at the community level that could be undertaken by crisis rehabilitation groups um, and uh, initiatives on campus in the aftermath of these types of um, violent incidents that can connect 
um, those sets of uh, individuals or college students with appropriate help. And um, in order to ensure that um, the harmful effects of uh, these uh, incidents can um, uh, not, uh, don't lead to adverse outcomes in the community. And then finally, talking at the level of the population here as an example, uh, we return to the COVID-19 pandemic example. And here, one thing that we noticed is um, that um, the pandemic has caused so many disruptions. In fact, we are still experiencing a number of disruptions in our personal um, and, and professional lives. For instance, the virtual format of this, of this workshop um, is one of those long-term disruptions. Um, but one thing that ha we have paid um, relatively lesser attention to is the impact on um, psychosocial concerns of individuals. So in this work, we wanted to provide population level insights about people's psychosocial concerns during the early phase of the pandemic. And for that, we used um, social media data. What we did is we obtained 60 million Twitter uh, streaming postings. These were uh, originated from inside the United States. So they have they had a geolocation information. Um, and we looked at the first three months of the pandemic and compared them with an equally um, sized sample of Twitter postings from the year before, which is uh, 2019. Um, what we found um, is that um, pretty much across the board, all of the psychosocial expressions that we looked at here and that you can see on the slide includes depression, anxiety, stress, suicidal ideation, and so on. Uh, these significantly increased during the COVID-19 crisis. But at the same time, over time, um, although this is just the first few months of the pandemic, we do see that there is a steady uh, decline and eventual plateauing of these psychosocial concerns, which may have happened due to habituation or settling into essentially a new norm. We conducted further language analysis on these postings, and we found that there are many unique uses of social media during the pandemic, as you can see from the chart on the right side around emotional and informational support. We um, found that people were appropriating social media platforms in order to express concerns around personal and professional life challenges, health and healthcare and precautionary measures, pandemic related awareness, but also they were coming to these platforms because they wanted to seek help. They wanted to get advice and engage in candid conversations about mental health um, in a way, in a less stigmatizing way that may not have been possible at, at other times before the pandemic. So what this study tells us is that it provides us a variety of different insights about what we can do about sort of this concomitant uh, crisis that is has already started um, as the actual pandemic is waning. And that is the crisis or, or the pandemic of mental health issues. What is it that we can do with these kinds of population level insights that can empower um, mental health care workers and other stakeholders and policymakers so that they can plan better, they can implement um, evidence-based me evidence measures that could actually help to um, reduce, if not completely mitigate, some of the mental health impacts um, of this crisis. And it also tells us the important role that these kinds of platforms play in the context of global crisis. Um, it uh, very much formed a backbone of social interaction during the COVID-19 pandemic, and especially individuals challenged with psychosocial concerns, it provided some sort of a safe haven to look for um, help and support. All right, so I'm going to take a little bit of a pause here, and um, I'm sure a question that might be running in your minds right now is, um, so these sound pretty interesting. Um, what is the next step in this line of research, right? Does it mean that we are ready for real world deployment, which would be to take some of these algorithms and use them to help people in the real world? Um, and if that has not happened, um, what is preventing us from actually pursuing these directions? So my answer to that question is that um, there are two important questions that are still remaining. These questions still need to be answered before some of these methods that I just discussed can fulfill the promise of actually helping people, especially when we think about clinical interventions. So what are these two questions? Uh, the first question is, are these um, algorithmic inferences valid um, and um, efficacious to work on populations of actual individuals 
struggling with actual mental illnesses, and then how do we situate this efficacy and validity? So to answer these questions, I'm going to um, spend a, the next few minutes kind of taking a critical perspective on the existing body of research that has appropriated social media data for mental health. I'm going to go back to the existing body of work and examine what is the efficacy and the validity of social media data that we see um, that seeks to predict mental health states to, towards informing clinical interventions. So one thing that we note here as we turn our, um, our attention back to the existing body of work is that um, researchers in this body of work and uh, us inclusive have often operationalized a variety of different types of online behaviors as proxies for mental health states. And why did they do that? They did, did that because honestly, ground truth data is pretty hard to come by in this domain, right? It is not your typical machine learning task where you can have gold standard data uh, in millions by simply asking crowd workers to label pictures or rate postings, right? Here, ideally, the ground truth needs to come from clinical assessments or assessments that are made by experts. But the advantage uh, with online data is that we have a variety of different types of behaviors that we can quantify and measure. And sometimes these behaviors can be proxies to other kinds of implicit Latin attributes of individuals. Um, and the advantage is that these proxies can be gathered pretty easily um, um, as well. So this, uh, the existing body of work, in the existing body of work, the researchers have overcome sort of some of the challenges and burden of obtaining clinical assessments um, by looking to these proxies um, and uh, using these proxies as indicators of the underlying mental illness of individuals. So what are some examples of these proxies? Um, you can see some of these examples on the slide. Three of them are noted here. Uh, one of that could be, um, you know, simply posting about um, your mental health um, around a certain hashtag. It could mean um, follow, uh, forming social connections with peers with mental health struggles. It could mean engaging in uh, or affiliating with a certain community that seeks to provide mental health support. Um, or sometimes it could also mean that uh, you um, gather uh, some sort of labels on somebody's Twitter postings based on a rating approach from some experts. But what is the problem? What is wrong with using proxies? Proxies have their own advantages. I'm going to return to that in a little bit. But let us talk a little bit about what kind of challenges do we face in terms of efficacy and validity when we rely on these proxies. So to answer that question, we looked at three popular proxy signals that have been used in the prior work. One is affiliation data, which is essentially uh, a person affiliating themselves to a certain community or an identity. Um, Self-report data, which has been heavily, heavily used in the literature where um, ground truth data comes from people simply uh, self-disclosing that they're suffering from a certain mental illness. And then appraise data, which also is a pretty popular technique in um, existing research where essentially postings of um, a certain individuals are evaluated by some expert to make an assessment whether this could be a person who is struggling with a mental illness. <clears throat> so we collected uh, Twitter data um, on uh, each of these uh, three proxies, and then we had matched control data for each of them. Essentially, matched control meant that that specific proxy was absent in uh, these individuals. Uh, parallelly, we also gathered patient data because remember our goal was to see if those proxies work well in a clinical population or actual people with actual experiences of mental illness. So here the patient population is essentially um, uh, part of a larger research study that I'm going to be talking about in just a bit. But these are essentially data of patients who were recruited to after they, they were diagnosed with schizophrenia. And these are individuals who are already in treatment or seeking treatment at a large healthcare system. Similarly here, we had um, matched controls, but here um, controls meant that these individuals did not have a diagnosis of schizophrenia uh, spectrum disorder. Our methodology was pretty straightforward. It was a uh, triangulation approach. The idea was to first establish internal validity of the proxy models, which would mean that you train the models uh, on each of these proxies and 
test them on a held out data set um, of the same proxy behavior. And then external validity, which would mean that we train the models on each of these proxies and then test them in, an, in a held out uh, data set of actual uh, schizophrenia patients. To keep things simple, we focused on a binary classification task and the focus of the task was to predict a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So what did we find? Um, I'll first talk about some of the replications uh, from prior work, which uh, gives uh, credence to these findings. So if you just look at the cross validation column here, you would see that all of these proxy models do pretty well when they're tested also on the same proxy data. Right. Um, these are just the accuracy measures here. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is the very right column where we are trying to establish external validity. And here we see that when you train the model on some of these proxies and then you test them on patient data, these models perform really, really poorly. Um, but what is also interesting is the, is the very bottom row here, which is on patient model. And here we see that it has comparable performance across both the cross validation and um, the test data set, meaning that this is a model that offers both high internal validity and external validity. But the others, while they provide high internal validity, when it comes to external validity, they, they perform very poorly. But the problems with these proxies did not just end there in our study. What we find is that they also suffer from poor construct validity. Um, to how we explain that is by looking at this table of top features. So here we look at the best performing proxy model and the worst performing proxy model. And we also look at the patient model. And we were looking at the top K features in, 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 in these models. Um, and if you were to just eyeball the types of uh, terms that are present across these three columns, you would see that there is actually very little overlap. What it means is that um, indeed, while, provi while uh, providing high internal validity, some of these proxy models are probably picking up on completely different sources of information from the data which brings into question, are they actually measuring what we think they're measuring, which is somebody's mental health state? As you know, that is the definition of construct validity. And as we devise new measures um, about any underlying psychology of, of an individual, in this case, uh, their mental health, ensuring that it, it um, provides strong construct validity is very important. But here we are finding that these proxies are not just bad in terms of external validity, but they are also pretty bad in terms of construct validity because they pretty much don't catch on any signal that we see the patient model to be catching on, right? So what are the takeaways in this work? Um, in this uh, critical perspective, um, in this critical empirical study, what we did was that we assessed the quality of different types of social media direct proxy behaviors. And we found that while these models are good, if that, if that is the specific proxy behavior you care about, but these models are not useful if we are hoping that they're ever gonna be useful to somebody with actual experience of mental illness, or in among a clinical population, right? Um, so it raises many pertinent questions to the mental health uh, and machine learning domain, right? Um, how do we improve on these proxies? Is it that we are not picking the right proxies and choosing the right proxies will address the problem? Or is it that how do we ensure that um, we build on this measure of efficacy and validity in the very design of the research itself so that construct validity and external validity are baked into that approach rather than as afterthoughts. In addition, one of the things that these, uh, this study also reveals are sort of some of the gaps that exist in the conduct of the research in, in this area as well. One of the reasons uh, we rely on proxies is because proxies are easy to gather. But as we know, um, that also means that the researchers are often detached or um, disconnected from the actual research subject population, which brings into question things like agency and power. Do people whose data are being analyzed, do they have the agency? Do they have the power to control how their data is being used and how proxies are, of their behaviors are being used to associate mental health diagnostic signals with them? And how can we be more inclusive 
um, in ensuring that these populations do get the agency and power going forward. Some of the other questions that um, this study um, also raises are questions around ethics and around unintended negative consequences, right? When we infer something based on a proxy behavior, if these models are not giving us high construct validity, we can have pretty negative outcomes, especially if such a model is deployed in providing clinical interventions because the model is probably not measuring mental health diagnosis at all. And broadly speaking, there are questions of ethics, right? Um, sort of what is our social and moral responsibility um, in this process, right? Um, how can we move away from this reliance on proxies and conduct the research in a way that is in harmony or in partnership with a variety of different stakeholders in the mental health domain? So ultimately these points that I raised here in the slides, that is a consideration of agency and power, um, thinking about unintended negative consequences and making arrangements to mitigate them and ethics broadly speaking, um, they need to be part of the research process itself rather than um, you know, as an afterthought. So in the remainder um, of this talk, I'm gonna be presenting a case study that would allow us to um, think about an approach to go about addressing these challenges and also the challenges we just noted earlier around the use of proxy signals um, and um, doing so in a way that emphasizes not just the technical possibilities, but it also builds measures to tackle some of these issues in the very research design um, itself. Although what I'm going to be talking about um, is, isn't necessarily um, uh, participatory action research, but it is certainly inspired by those approaches. And this case study that I'm going to be talking about has been part of an ongoing collaboration between my research lab and uh, Northwell Health, um, which is one of the largest health systems in the state of New York um, over the past uh, six years. The specific uh, research I'm talking about is part of this broader uh, initiative called Thrive. Um, and within the Thrive project, we have been designing and deploying a variety of different um, uh, tools and technologies that could be used by patients, clinicians, and their support givers in order to improve treatment of mental illnesses. Um, we are exploring how these technologies could potentially be powered by patients' social media and online data in order to provide more um, evidence and empower these important stakeholders um, uh, in uh, the way they navigate the challenges um, of the mental health experience. The specific question in this case study is the question of relapse. And the reason I'm, what we are focusing on it is relapse is pretty common in pretty much any serious mental illness. If we take the example of schizophrenia, which is what we explored in the prior um, uh, work that I just discussed around proxy behaviors, um, it, it, it affects about 1% of the world's population, which is significant. Um, but what is challenging is that even when people are under treatment, there is a ch very high chance that they will relapse um, at any point in time. But what baffles clinicians is that oftentimes they have very poor handle on relapse. They get to know of a relapse after the patient has relapsed, which is normally when the patient is back at the health center with exacerbated symptoms and the symptoms are severe enough that the patient has to be hospitalized. So our clinician partners from Northwell in this work were interested in challenging the status quo. How do we go from a retrospective approach to a proactive um, approach um, where um, we are trying to see if there is something in the social media data of these patients that, give, that could give clues to the patient and to the clinician so that they could be better prepared to make changes in the treatment plan of the patient that could hopefully avoid a relapse from occurring altogether. So one of the things that I noted is um, agency and power are, are very important to do this kind of research, right? So uh, patient perspectives were super important in this work. And um, uh, that's because it is ultimately their data who, which will power these investigations around relapse prediction that we are talking about. And at the same time, they are also the people who will potentially benefit from these models 
or be harmed by these models, right? Um, so to incorporate patient perspectives, we conducted um, a series of surveys um, and interviews um, of, of patients seeking treatment at this health center. Um, and we found that there was overwhelming support for this um, research. And that's because patients recognized the value of sharing or volunte volunteering this data for this research. And they felt that this could have um, positive outcomes for their own treatment, or maybe for the treatment of other people um, who were to come after them, so treatment of peers. Um, so empowered with those insights, we follow the best practices um, in computational psychiatry research um, during our entire data collection process, um, and then um, we ensured that patients actually had the agency to remove themselves from the study at any time if um, they felt that uh, it was interfering with their treatment. So now returning to uh, the question of um, relapse, um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, an analysis that was done early on in this project. It includes the data of a little over 100 patients. These individuals were diagnosed with a psychotic disorder, such as schizophrenia spectrum disorder, and half of them had experienced a relapse in the form of a hospitalization, which is typically the clinically valid measure of uh, 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 relapse, though not the only one. Um, we gathered all of the consented patients' Facebook data, um, and this included several um, thousand uh, posts and comments over a very long period spanning multiple years. So now let me tell you a little bit about the considerations in our modeling approach. And these were guided through a series of discussions that happened with our clinical partners um, um, in order to ensure that uh, very question of construct validity. We want to make sure that when we build the models, these models are actually measuring what we want them to measure, and also ensuring that the models we are building actually come to use or reflect the reality of how mental health treatment happens in uh, the real world. So in um, in this in discussions of this modeling approach, we discovered we had many uh, eye opening. Um, uh, uh, learnings and, and uh, uh, new information that emerged. One of the things that we got to know is that relapse events are actually multifactorial. Um, that is, they actually manifest in many different ways in many different people. Um, so basically, they're associated with high levels of clinical heterogeneity. This was not the only challenge, though. We also found that there are actually no true positives and true negatives in this setup, um, which means, uh, which essentially is because an individual could have a relapse at any point in time. They have a non-zero likelihood of relapse at any point in time. And that means that um, time has to be factored into um, this modeling approach and you cannot just simply apply supervised machine learning approaches for this modeling task. And then finally, although relapses do happen um, um, in a lot of people, for a, for a certain individual, for a particular individual, relapses are still a pretty rare event. So to counteract the reality of this data and to also enhance potential use and construct validity of the algorithms we build, what we did is we modeled the relapse prediction problem as an anomaly detection problem. So here the idea is that there are uh, any individual, any patient experiences periods of health, um, and then they experience periods of relapse. So periods of relapse are essentially what happens in their life just before they were hospitalized. These are essentially the anomalies and our clinician partners said that those are what they're most interested to see. When are those outliers or anomalies happening in the behavior of people? Can we identify those anomalies because that would then be a precursor to a relapse and now you have this um, you know, preemptive information that you can act upon rather than waiting for the actual relapse to happen. So in this case, we looked at um, one to three months of uh, um, data uh, as periods of health for every patient. And then we had a one month long data set for every patient as the period of relapse, which is the month prior to their relapse hospitalization. 
we focused on a variety of um, different um, uh, features here that included um, uh, socialization features, a variety of behaviors that are specific to uh, the Facebook platform, uh, which is the data that we are using here. We looked at a variety of different language attributes, all the way from psycholinguistic features to um, battle words approaches and to topics. And then we had a few domain specific uh, features that were motivated uh, based on clinician's experience of observing uh, patient interactions. This includes things like word, repeat, word repeatability, readability, and so on. So these are often observed in um, schizophrenia patients when they're not in good health because they can be indicative of um, high levels of preoccupation with specific um, topics. So these features were used to train up um, a one class uh, support vector machine model, which is a common anomaly detection approach. Um, and you might be curious, so what did we find? Um, our findings in many ways were um, very, very interesting. So here's specificity, let's look at that measure, but specificity here means relapses that were correctly predicted to be relapses. This was really good for us. We um, were at 79% in terms of correctly predicting relapses to be relapses. So most times when there was an actual relapse, our model was able to detect that. But where we didn't do so well on is the measure of sensitivity, which is the second line you see here, which is a situation when our model thinks that this specific period for the specific patient is a period of relapse, but when we look at the ground truth data, it says that's actually a period of health. That error was very common in our data, so sensitivity turned out to be just 37%. But like I said, one of the important things about um, ethical use of these algorithms is not just to show and optimize for the best possible performance, but also to figure out when they don't work and why. So to answer this latter part, what we did is that we wanted to poke around and see why is it that sensitivity is so low? And is there some benefit to be had still from this kind of an algorithm? And when the algorithm makes these kinds of uh, mistakes, how can we gain a better insight into what might be happening? So to answer all of these questions, we looked at uh, a yet so far not used source of data, which is um, clinical chart reviews. So these are essentially free text um, information that are you know, noted by clinicians uh, after their consultations with patients. And these are part of the electronic medical record. So here we wanted to see, is there something noted in the clinical uh, charts of these patients who were um, you know, um, false negatives in our uh, case? So that is, that means that the model thought that these are relapses, but actually they're um, not relapses in the ground truth data. We found luckily that for about half of those cases, we had some information noted in uh, the chart reviews. And in fact, for 90% of those, non-empty chart reviews, what we found was fascinating. We found that the clinicians in these cases did actually note that there were some psychotic symptoms for um, these patients um, at that point in time. But given the subjectivity involved in mental health treatment, these clinicians at that point in time assessed that the symptoms were not severe enough to warrant a hospitalization. But this is what machine learning does. It fails to capture that context. It fails to capture that decision-making that is opaque or goes behind the scenes. In the data, it just shows up that this is actually um, uh, you know, a healthy period for this patient. Although in the mind of the clinician, there was a decision-making that went behind it because the person did show some symptoms. Our model, on the other hand, is looking at Facebook data and is picking up some of these signals, which it thinks are something like psychotic symptoms, which not to blame the algorithm, this is something that the clinician noted as well, right? Um, so what this tells us is that maybe the algorithm is not so wrong after all, but what probably we need to do um, as part of these modeling efforts of mental health um, um, uh, in mental in digital mental health is to incorporate these types of rich context into the models so that this exercise that I just described 
is somehow represented in a systematic fashion in the way we approach and use um, data um, in um, order to make these predictions about different adverse outcomes in mental health. So what did we learn here? There was so much to learn from this study. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, the one thing that we learned is that um, looking at individual level anomalies are super important. Just knowing population level differences between those who relapse and those who don't can be a fun academic exercise, but actually it's not useful to clinicians because what they want to do is they want to help a single person at a single point in time. They want to make sure that they're making that decision as accurately as possible. So the question for clinical intervention uh, when it comes to use of social media data um, is probably a question of these individual level personalized addresses. It is not about uh, classifying individuals to be experiencing relapses or not. This work also tells us that comp construct validity, which we noticed to be an issue in one of the previous works, that is really central and important. It is also important to understand not just when an algorithm works, but also when it doesn't work and why so that clinicians could be more empowered to use that information. They would know when to use this information and when to discard that. So um, this kind of work can, and can have a lot of implications that can inform clinician decision-making. It can help people um, get connected with appropriate and culturally and context and sensitive care. Um, and it opens up new doors to incorporating these algorithms in the existing work practices. Um, uh, of clinicians. So I'm going to quickly uh, give you a couple more examples um, of other case studies um, that kind of um, have a similar flavor, like this one that I went in much depth. Um, but that also attends to these initial questions I read around validity, efficacy, agency, um, and unintended negative consequences. So this um, other example um, has been a collaboration with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention around uh, suicide prevention. And here, um, you know, we are thinking about how can we devise participatory and stakeholder-centered machine learning approaches that can um, go beyond sort of this clinical context into other places where social media data can come to be valuable. Um, so, like I said, uh, this project is on suicide prevention, and one of the major motivations here was that um, the, the alarming observation that the rates of suicide in the U.S. in the last 20 years overall has have been increasing. Um, although this is such an urgent um, public health concern, unfortunately, there isn't a real-time source of information on suicide fatality trends right now. And that is um, um, you know, a huge challenge because without that, um, you don't have accurate information to make budgetary decisions or to devise public health uh, campaigns um, uh, and interventions. So we wanted to um, kind of provide a first of its kind um, machine learning based uh, uh, framework that could estimate weekly suicide fatalities in near real time um, that would harness signals from many different sources. As you can see in the slide, we combined information from both online sources um, as well as from traditional uh, public health data sources. And that included things such as um, emergency department visits, calls made on the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, and so on. Um, what we did is that we've developed an ensemble uh, framework um, that combined information from these signals. And we were pretty good at predicting or estimating rates, weekly rates of suicide fatalities at the national level within the range of a percentage of error. Not just that, our model actually performed significantly better um, by over 10 percentage points over a simple baseline model, uh, autoregressive model that simply looked at historical fatality data to predict future fatalities. So what this tells us is that, um, you know, the different ways that we can envision social media to be situated in the work um, of a variety of different mental health stakeholders. In this case, it was the CDC and it was the public health workers who are working to raise awareness, fight stigma, 
and connect people with better care when it comes to mental health concerns. And here we are showing the, the valuable insights that social media can provide. But at the same time, recognizing that social media is not the only player here. Not everybody is on social media. Um, not everybody uses social media in the same way. And that underscores the importance of also looking at these other traditional data sources. So going back to that question of construct validity, how can we bolster or improve construct validity by combining data across different types of sources? That's what this project tells us about. And finally, I want to give a, a quick example here that is um, um, a study that was done in collaboration with a nonprofit organization that advocates a gun violence prevention called Every Town uh, for Gun Safety. And here we were interested to look at the mental health impacts of active shooter drills. And we found that this, um, um, uh, by looking to social media, we are able to identify the adverse impact that um, active shooter drills are having um, in the psychologies of K through 12 school students, their teachers, and um, their parents. But here also we adopted a participatory approach in order to address some of the initial challenges I noted around agency and power, ethics, and unintended consequences. This was a study where we work very closely with a couple of um, activist groups called Moms Demand Action and Student Demand Action. These are essentially grassroots organizations comprising K through 12 students and uh, the parents of K through 12 students. And um, our approach followed a mixed method strategy where we developed computational insights by looking at Twitter data. As you can see some of the findings here that looks at elevated levels of stress and anxiety and depression following these um, incidents of active shooter drills. But at the same time, taking these findings back to these moms and students and teachers and getting their anecdotal and personal insight into these trends. That is another flavor of participatory research I wanted to highlight here as another possibility that to, could bring more agency and power to the people who are likely to be impacted by the findings of these kinds of algorithms that harness social media data for mental health. I would start to wrap up here. Um, I would note that um, you know, hopefully, you saw a lot of promise in in some of these um, projects that I discussed. They, there are many promising solutions and approaches to um, uh, maybe uh, pick from these uh, type of projects and move forward. But I would also note that these are far from complete, and I recognize that there are many unanswered questions that still remain. Why don't we talk about some of those questions? So the first one that I always note is the question of algorithmic performance, right? I mean, being a computer scientist, I ask myself that question all the time. That yes, on the one hand, we do want to make our algorithms better so that they actually perform better when deployed in the real world. But the question is, when are we ever going to know what level of performance is good enough, right? Um, and we have to acknowledge that how much ever we try with a purely technical approach, we are never going to have perfect algorithms. We are always going to have uncertainty in machine learning, which is central to its very conception. So instead of optimizing for performance um, as a techno solutionist approach, why don't we instead ask the question, given that errors are likely to happen, how do we support graceful failures when we know that in some situations, these data or these models will not stand up to the potential use case. This actually ties very well with something that clinicians do. Turns out that clinicians find themselves asking that question all the time as well, which is why if you know clinicians, you would know that at the beginning of their careers, they take the Hippocratic Oath, which says doing no harm. How can I provide treatment to a person in a way that actually helps them? But if I cannot help someone, at least I don't do any harm to them. I believe that that is the approach that we have to take with algorithm design that look at sources of data like social media to uh, met out mental health. 
The next question is about um, the future of mental health work, right? I mean, we are envisioning a future in which we have humans, we have machines um, providing very complementary expertises, and both have something to offer when it comes to mental health right? Um, for humans, it is a person, obviously, a person with the lived experience of mental health knows something about their own experience. We have clinicians, we have public health experts, um, we have the support communities of these people with lived experience. Um, how do we move forward in a world where we now introduce an algorithm in this already complex and crowded ecosystem of multiple human stakeholders? Because it brings up a lot of questions, not just about how that algorithm will be a part of work, but also what would it mean for these people to continue to do the work that they have already been doing? Do they have to acquire new skills? Um, do they need to have some kind of a shared mental model of how they work and how algorithms work? Importantly, how do we ensure trust, right? Um, we want these different stakeholders, including humans and machines to work in a harmonious way in a synergistic way, rather than in a situation where one rejects the opinion of the other. And finally, there are questions um, of um, social justice, right? Um, one of the powerful um, um, arguments in favor of using social media is that um, there are many otherwise underserved populations who are using social media and who are online. So now we have a real opportunity to serve those marginalized or low resource communities. But at the same time, we have to recognize that machine learning and artificial intelligence, broadly speaking, imbibes and encodes biases in the society. Sometimes they even exacerbate them. So the question is, how do we fundamentally rethink the design of these kinds of algorithms so that we can um, connect people with culturally, culturally appropriate resources by harnessing algorithms that doesn't marginalize their identity, but enables them to um, experience um, a path to recovery in a more tailored and personalized fashion. Before I end up, I would note that um, as much as I talk about many of the technical decisions on this work, I fundamentally believe that this kind of work is socio-technical work, right? It is socio-technical work because um, of a social piece. Um, and as the quote in the slide says, many people have mistrust in existing um, in the existing mental health system, but also uh, technology can exacerbate some of those mistrusts. We know that from other contexts. So the question is, how can we humanize our approaches, right? So that people feel that they have an opportunity to work with other stakeholders to define what can work best for them, but also define what will not work for them. If an algorithm is not the right choice or option for a person, we have to recognize that as well. Essentially, some of the examples um, that I told you today about, um, I, I hope that, um, you know, it uh, gives you some food for thought. It um, um, at least uh, tells you that we need more research to identify what is sort of the best way to go about this kind of research going forward so that it actually can be um, used in the benefit of people. But at the same time, how do we move forward through some of these open research challenges? That's all what I have for you today. Thank you very much. Uh, I would, uh, before I conclude, I would like to thank all my students, collaborators, and importantly, the uh, funding organizations who sponsored many parts of this work and without any, none of whose support this will ever be possible. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you and I can take a few questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for your informative um, presentation. I personally learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, any questions from the audience? Um, hi, um, just want to thank you very much for the very exciting talk. I'm Diana Inkman of Computer Science at University of Ottawa. So you are mentioning that um, we, the uh, clinician could use a tool if in some cases, if we know that it's reliable, in other cases. So do you have in mind something like a confidence measure in the prediction? Because all machine learning algorithms could use such thing, or all, all practical applications. And we know how the how reliable is this confidence measure, but still 
Is that the first thing that comes to mind for you too? Certainly, yeah, that can be uh, something that is used, but um, I think we have to go a bit beyond sort of the surface level performances and confidence measures, because confidence measures are only going to say that, you know, the algorithm is pretty confident about this estimate, other times it is not. But clinicians, even when it is not what we realized in our participatory work is that sometimes clinicians want to know even when the algorithm is not confident, because they feel like Maybe there is still something that the algorithm is offering that I could use. Maybe I will not use the eventual, I guess, the decision that the algorithm is making, but it's still probably picking up something that might be useful for me to know. And that is why we wanted to kind of take this route of looking to the underlying context that may be missing um, from the representation of the algorithm. Uh, so certainly confidence measures can be useful, but we need a lot more. Some people call these um, uh, explainability, but that is another funny topic because some of the work that we did kind of says that explainability is close to what clinicians want, um, but it is not everything because clinicians are used to working with a situation where they they don't have any explainability or interpretability, right? They recommend medications to patients. It's not like they understand how those medications actually work with the biology of the person but they have a pretty good knowledge in the sense that they know whether a certain medication will be actionable or not. So maybe the right measure could be actionability, which is how do you give enough information to the clinician so that they can use some part of whatever the algorithm might be producing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? I have a more broader uh, question. First of all, thank you very much, Munmun. This was very interesting and informative. Um, so when I think about um, study designs, observational type study designs that we reported here, um, so I often think about um, the development of the hypotheses, right? Um, so how would one come about, and I, and I realize that in a lot of the things that you mentioned, you have partners from, um, from domain experts uh, that you refer to and rely on. Um, but sometimes I wonder, uh, there's a difference between how we can do observational studies and develop the hypotheses from a computer science point of view compared to how people in health services would develop the, those hypotheses. And the difference being that, that those uh, people from the domain would actually have their you know, daily dealings with their patients or you know, so on. And then they start developing these hypotheses. For us, we're looking at social data at a larger scale. So we're not actually dealing with people on an individual basis to develop the hypothesis. So what are your thoughts about um, systematically developing hypotheses that could be tested at a large scale as opposed to you know, what, what is typically done with domain experts that are usually at smaller scales? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think uh, one um, more straightforward approach is to work with a lot of different domain experts. Um, like there are people who are trying to kind of take these algorithms, maybe which are developed with um, data of patients from one health system and trying to uh, like see how they work in a different health system. Um, and, and that would be one way to see if the hypothesis that you framed and tested in one uh, context are transferable to another. Um, but at the same time, I think it is important to not just um, take um, just a purely um, domain-driven approach to hypothesis generation or a purely data-driven approach, which essentially is a no hypothesis approach we see pretty commonly in you know, computer science or data science. And maybe there is a middle ground, and that's what we try to pursue in our work is that how can we get enough from the domain experts to scaffold our analysis? At the same time, keeping an open mind that what the clinicians are telling us, that might still be only a subset of all of the things that we can possibly measure with something like social media, right? And I'll give you a concrete um, example of that. And it's a pretty simple feature that 
repeatedly researchers have seen to be a, a strong indicator of mental health concerns, and that is first person singular pronoun use in writing. Um, you know, it's just a feature, right? In fact, many, many computer scientists would get rid of pronouns because it's essentially a stop word. But anyway, that aside, if, even if you were counting stop words, it's still a feature. So we are not thinking too much about it, what this might actually mean from a hypothesis perspective. But when we talk with domain experts, we learn that actually many people with mental illness um, tend to have um, high levels of self-preoccupation. They keep on talking about themselves and not very connected with their social context. So how would that manifest in writing? In writing, that would manifest as using a lot of first person singular pronouns. So that is one of these examples where you kind of we kind of go into the data with an open mind, we find different patterns, but then we use the information and insights and expertise of the domain uh, stakeholders to scaffold our understanding of those. So that could be one approach, which is sort of that middle ground. But mm -hmm. it is honestly speaking a pretty hard question because one of the biggest challenges in digital mental health is to have a lot of different hypotheses, a lot of different studies, but few that actually have that generalizability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And and just a, a quick follow up on that is generalizability, right? Typically, when you do control trials, you know the population that you're working with. But when you're doing large scale observational studies, it's very hard to to qualify the type of population that you're extracting data from because because of many reasons, right? Uh, unknown identities, dis different geographical distributions and so on. Mm -hmm. so what are your yes. thoughts about generalizability of findings given we don't really know the population too well? Yeah, so one um, thing that I didn't, one piece of work I didn't talk about here, but one of my uh, current uh, PhD students is working on something um, we are calling cultural validity, in addition to the other kinds of psychometric validity we spoke about. And that gets at, very, at that very point that you raised is that, yeah, we might be uh, building some algorithms with data of a certain population. We have no idea how that will generalize to another cultural context, right? So one of the things maybe we need to emphasize more is to define in what context are these algorithms appropriate? In what context do, do we know that they work? And what are the scenarios that we can say that we have currently no evidence to say anything for or against? And cultural validity needs to be central to the way we evaluate these algorithms as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you so much. And we have a question on the chat. You, you want me to look at it? Yeah, I can. Um, if I understand the question correctly, the question is um, about overfitting. Is that the question? Like, how much do you think, or, or is the question about having confidence in the data? Can you, whoever asked that question, can you explain that? Hi. Yeah, absolutely, Hi. Dr. Chaudhary. Um, fascinating talk, and I've been um, following your work on Kai from for a few years. So it's great to uh, hear you talk in person. Um, so I'm kind of looking for your um, some guidance from you in terms of handling this um, prediction challenge that I have with like predicting substance use relapse. So what you shared about schizophrenia relapse prediction, how um, like the relapse is a rare event and also the sensitivity is low comparing to the, the specificity. So that's exactly what I'm experiencing right now. And I'm working on that as my like thesis research. Um, so I'm wondering what, what your thoughts on when I should just call it a day and say, okay, this is as good as the model is going to get. Let me try to work on the model explainability piece and say, what can we, um, what kind of insights can we uncover from the machine learning performance and perhaps inform clinical practice and, and point out the variables that are previously unknown for like predictive of, um, that are predictive of relapse. Um, so, but my concern is always that, you know, if my model doesn't have brilliant sensitivity, who am I to tell the physicians that, okay, the machine learning model suggests 
this particular risk factor could be uh, helpful to look at? Yeah, it's a hard question. And that's what I said um, uh, towards the later part of the talk is that what is a good enough predictive performance for real world use, right? There is no golden answer to it. And I don't think there will ever be one. Um, even for the same problem for relapse prediction and substance misuse, you look at different populations like we were just talking a little while back, or you look at different settings, you may require different levels of performance in order to be comfortable with a certain intervention. So I don't think we, we uh, will ever get to a situation where we can give concrete answers to that. Instead, I think the question should be sort of this participatory iterative approach is to work with the domain stakeholder to see that is there still something that you find valuable? And it often disappoints many computer scientists, including myself, I've been disappointed, is sometimes we think that many fancy things is what the clinicians or the stakeholders need from us, but honestly, they're probably looking for something very simple. And that's fine, you know, Occam's razor, right? Um, if a simple approach or a simple signal that may not have the level of performance or, or the depth that you would desire to have as a technical person. If that's serving the cause, then I don't think there is anything to be worried about. So that is sort of one answer I would give to that question. But at the same time, you know, um, questions of um, sensitivity and um, specificity are important and, you know, rigor is important. So, you know, like thinking about power analysis and things like that um, early on, kind of how much data should you be collecting to start with? Those would be like good starting points to at least, you know, start out on a strong footing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other question? Okay, if uh, there is no question, thank you so much everybody again for joining the workshop. I uh, hand it over to Ibrahim to wrap up the workshop. Thank you everybody. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dechaudhry for your excellent talk. I think everyone enjoyed it uh, very much. Um, so this, this concludes this year's Amazon 2022 uh, workshop on mental health and social media. Um, I was joined by uh, Diana Inkpen, Fatana Zainkalam, and uh, Christopher um, in organizing. And hopefully we'll see everyone in the next edition next year. Uh, Diana, any final well, thank you very much for the invited speaker, Moon, and thank you, Fatima and Ibrahim, for organizing and doing all the work. <laughs> thank you. Very, very exciting discussion in the morning and the afternoon. Yeah. So many open questions that we should keep having this kind of forums. Yeah, and, and, and obviously, thank you to our uh, keynote speaker this morning and, and the panels, uh, panelists. Um, also, very exciting discussions in the panel as well. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.